Good evening. Welcome. My name is Richard Wells. I'm the chair of the Milton Select Board. Welcome to the Tuesday, August 27th, 2024, regular meeting of the Milton Select Board. We are here at the Council on Aging, and I would ask, I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask everyone to please stand the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. So, Ms. Bradley is a little under the weather tonight. I don't see her on there. If she is to join for any part of the meeting, we would go to a roll call vote with her being a. If not, we'll still vote in the present or in the, in the A and A. And if I see that change or she lets you know, we'll. Um, We'll go. So, uh, item number three, public comment. We allow 21, is, do we have, I take it, I see the sheet. Do we have people, raise your hand that I'll, that I'll know. Anyone here for public comment? Okay. Yeah, so for public there. comment, we will allow, we allow 21 minutes. Each speaker is allowed to speak for three minutes. Um, Mr. Milano, oh, thank you. I got it. Mr. I'll call you that. Mr. Milano will... Um, keep the 21 minute, the total allotted time. I'll keep the three minute time. I'll give each speaker a 30 second. When you're getting close to three minutes, I'll give you a 30 second warning to say, time to wrap it up. Um, let me just get to my stopwatch here, please. One second. And there we go. Okay. And I have one hand raised on so hopefully I can get everyone. So I'm going to start with. Mr. Joe Henning, if you'd please, when you take a seat, just state your name and your address. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Phil Joe Henning, 23 Parkwood Drive. It's been a couple of months since the MCAC uh, rep for Milton uh, resigned, and there are a number of important things coming up at the MCAC this, this coming year. Uh, the September meeting will be held next month. And I think that it would be a great idea for the select board to appoint a uh, representative by that time. And I would like to be considered. I, I believe I'm the only person who uh, documented their interest in the position. I believe my 11 years of uh, involvement uh, with the airplane noise and pollution recommends me. I'm, uh, I've attended uh, a tremendous number of MCAC meetings over the years. I'm known by the people who, uh, who populate the MCAC from other towns. Uh, I think um, particularly with issues like, uh, I was in Lincoln last week and uh, I noticed a lot of signs protesting the idea that uh, Hanscom Field would be expanded for uh, its use would be expanded for um, private planes. And they uh, protest against private planes, but the idea is they don't want them at Hanscom Field. So if they don't go to Hanscom Field, where are they going to go? They've complained to the governor uh, about pollution, but we'll get the pollution if they don't. You can't stop the use of private planes. That's not going to happen. So I think in order to protect Milton from, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure they'll be victorious. And the way uh, that other communities work, and I don't think that Milton has worked this way uh, a lot, is in, uh, in an alliance with our neighbors. And I think we need to be much more committed to common cause with Quincy, Braintree, Hingham, uh, and I want to do that. I also want to take an opportunity to meet with um, city council members from Boston to uh, push for a Dorchester um, rep. There isn't one now. Dorchester is tremendously affected by airplane noise and pollution. Uh, I think we need to create um, an alliance. I think we need to work with our neighbors and I think we ought to uh, try 30, 30 seconds, Johanny, as hard as we minutes. can uh, to push those private planes back to Hanscom, uh, prevent the problem here. And there are a number of other issues that are important to us that we need to work on. And I'd like to be the representative to do it. Thank okay. you. Thank you.
Dr. Kutcher. Thank you. I'm Cindy Christensen. I live at 59 Colomore Street. Like many town residents, I've wondered how it was determined that 26 additional classrooms are needed in our district by 2028 in order to keep average class sizes about where they were in 2018. With the help of others, we have written a report on the Assessment of School Classroom Needs 2024 that contains our research, calculations, requests, recommendations, and questions. There appears to be two critical problems with the number 26 additional classrooms. First, we cannot replicate the need for 26 classrooms using the very same data that the DRA architectural firm used in 2018 to arrive at that number. We question this possible misclassification. Also, when we used the most recent enrollment data that we could find, we determined a need of about zero to perhaps five or six additional classrooms across the district through school year 2033. So there appears to be two problems with the number 26. One problem is a possible mistake in the DRA study where this number was first reported. The second problem is that there has been no update to the classroom calculations using more recent data. The, Mil the residents in Milton should not be asked to build a $173 million new school based on this outdated and possibly incorrect number 26. Moving forward with the goal to build a new school before rectifying the inconsistencies that we found in the projected needs is financially irresponsible. We provided select board member Cohane with our report just a few hours ago, and when he has a chance to review it, we ask that it be distributed widely. All of our numbers have been fact-checked and, re and are referenced in the report. This does not mean that the report is without typos or other errors, but we have done our best with the limited time we have had. Given the recently requested additional expenditures and ballot timeline proposed by the school building committee, we think that getting our results out soon is best so that more eyes and minds can assess our results. We will appreciate everyone's careful review and criticism 30, 30 back by additional talking. thank you, backed by additional references and numbers. We welcome an opportunity to continue to do our no cost to the town analyses on these uh, issues. I will not be here for your response to public speak, but you all know how to find me. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to pronounce this correctly. So is it? Ashism? How do you? Yes, Ashism. Ashism. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Welcome. select board members. My name is Ashish Jaswal, and I live in 34 Woodlot Drive in Milton. I'm here with some other residents from Milton Woods, as well as Indian Cliffs and uh, Stoughton, Governor Stoughton Lane, to express a concern with the ongoing RFP process and the proposed plan for the town farm. Um, in September 2023, uh, you held a public hearing to get input from the Milton residents and the neighbors on this project, but that was after a decision had been made to send out an RFP uh, for building 35 uh, units in an affordable uh, housing complex. The residents of Milton did not have an opportunity to provide input uh, into that process. Uh, and we, and um, it seems that no other users or potential users of that land was considered. Today, we are requesting the trustees to revisit that decision. Our concerns are that you have not fully considered all potential users of the town farm land for the poor of, the Mil of Milton. Please, let's think again if affordable housing is the best use under the trust document. It doesn't help the most needy residents of Milton, and it's not exclusively for the residents of Milton. 
Could there be better use of this land? We believe so. We request the select board members to consider other options as well, such as selling the land and using the proceeds to fund initiatives like the Milton Residence Fund. Here the funds will impact a much larger community of Milton residents and in need for years to come. In October last year, uh, Noreen Dolan requested additional funds from the town because um, she said she was, she, the fund was running out prior or before the end of the year because the need was so great. Another option with significant impact could be to build a food pantry. We believe there are many other uses for the town farm land that might better meet the requirements of the trust that the land be used for the poor of Milton in perpetuity. So we request you, the trustees, 30 and seconds, thank you, no, keep going, 30 trustees seconds. Trustees and fiduciaries of this land, that you take all this into account when forming a committee to advise you on the best use of town farm land. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Edward Kearns. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ed Kearns, and my family and I live at 100 Governor Soton Lane. Last time I was in this room was about a year ago during the public comment for this proposed project for the town farm. And given the speed with which the RFP was then turned around, clearly had the appearance of perfunctory box checking, that none of the concerns raised by residents were ever going to be considered. So tonight, along with fellow neighbors, here to remind the board that those concerns still stand. Most notably, that if Governor Stoughton Lane is to be the main thoroughfare for access to these proposed new units, the street is not an acceptable option as it currently stands. The road is too narrow. Every time I exit my own street or turn onto my street, I hold my breath and hope that there is no one moving in the opposite direction because the pitch of the road as it meets Canton Ave makes it very difficult to see any oncoming traffic, whether you are exiting the road or trying to turn onto the road. The width of the street, the lack of sidewalks, the fact that to widen the street would require movement of utility poles. Widening the street may very well require taking land from abutters, including many rock walls that given that this is Massachusetts, I assume that there's some historical component too. All of these concerns, which revolve around basic measures of safety for our families, are completely absent from this RFP process. And it certainly seems as if, in the interest of transparency, that that should be up front when trying to solicit any bids for this property, that those bidding for that realize that in order for this to be viable, the road is going to need to be widened, which as I mentioned, brings in many other issues. There needs to be a sidewalk. And the additional issues of flooding and water, which some of my neighbors spoke about last September, also seem to have been mostly ignored. So rather than moving forward with speed on this project, we would request that our concerns be addressed directly and transparently. 30 seconds. And that moving forward, the question of whether or not this is the best project for that property be formally addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gino Prosica. Good, Good evening. Good evening. I'm Gino Prusakov. I live at 36 Woodlot Drive. It happens to be the lot that's immediately adjacent to the uh, land in question that the previous two neighbors spoke about. I'm 
fairly new to the beautiful town of Milton. We've lived here for about three years. Not too new to this country. Lived about a third of my life in this country. But one of the primary reasons why we've decided to migrate to the United States is that unlike in the Soviet Union where I was born and raised, people here have the right to be heard and participate in the decisions that impact the consequences of which impact the communities in which they live. Now, I've listened to the points that were made um, by the previous two fellow neighbors to the points that were made in September, sort of post decision as it was mentioned. And it does seem to me that it makes sense to slow down a bit, take a step back and ask such questions as have all the possible options for uh, the use of the land really been considered to evaluate each one's pros, cons, to make sure you arrive at the most appropriate one. Is affordable housing really it? We do need affordable housing, but is this the place for it? Squeezing in 35 units into a, you know, three serene neighborhoods of single family homes. Um, have all the corresponding issues, flooding, safety, et cetera, been taken into account, proper mitigation risks put in place, or at least thought of? And lastly, but equally importantly, why was neighbor involvement welcomed really only post decision? Um, I urge the Governor Stoughton Trust to reconsider the use of this land, to carefully weigh all of the available options, and to arrive at the most optimal decision. And as you um, think of the committee to appoint, um, I urge you to carefully consider the charge of the committee so that its members could have the ability to consider other uses for the land, uses that have not been fully explored yet, uses that could be even more beneficial to the trust, to the poor of Milton, and to the residents of Milton. That's Thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Callahan. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Tom Callahan, 16 Orono Street, Precinct 4 Town Meeting Member and a member of the Affordable Housing Trust. Thank you for meeting later tonight as the Governor Stoughton Trustees and placing on the agenda an item to appoint a review committee for the proposals regarding Tarn Farm. Since six months has elapsed since two development teams submitted responses to the RFP for Town Farm, we thought it would be helpful to refresh residents on where we are in this process. On February 16th, Affirmative Investments and the Milton Partnership for Community Reinvestment submitted responses to a request for proposals that the Governor Stoughton Trustees issued on December 6th, 2023. Both proposals call for 35 homes on the site. Both development teams consist of highly respected firms in the region with deep experience in housing and affordable housing development. We are here today to figure out the future of the remaining three and a half acres of our historic poor farm. A piece of land with a rich history of serving our poor, but with a recent past that has been dominated by neglect and inaction over the past 20 years or more. We are faced with deteriorating structures in mounting liability for the town, an animal shelter poised to move soon to a beautiful new facility off of Randolph Ave, and an historic opportunity to use this land in perpetuity to house Milton's poor, just as the will demands, and how this site has been used for much of its history since being deeded to the town in 1701. There is considerable town-wide interest in what happens on our poor farm. As the Affordable Housing Trust representative appointed to the committee, I look forward to working with those you appoint to review the RFP responses, interviewing the development teams, and discussing the future of the site that is such a big part of our history and of our future. Thank you. Thank you. So I have one. Anyone else here present for, that didn't sign up? So I have one online. Attendee, you can. Ms. Rosemarin, I can't, I know, Ada. Rosemarin, um, 
you can, whenever you can hear us, you can speak. You're unmuted. Or unmute yourself. Here Good you go. evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Good evening. This Good is evening. Ada Rosemarin, 32 Columbine Road. I was greatly disappointed that the select board voted to not put a new school on the November ballot. I see this as an opportunity lost for our town and our children. As students return to school tomorrow, this development will be deeply disappointing for families and Milton Public School staff who've held out hope for a new school that was planned to open in 2027. The current funding for the school building committee is set to be fully expended in September, leaving this project on hold until such time when the town moves to continue the funding needed. We cannot let this happen. The school building committee needs a fall town meeting to approve additional funding to continue its progress toward the design of a new school and to respond to queries made by the select board that were beyond the schematic design budget. It surprises me that this did not happen to make it on the agenda for tonight. I know you have a long agenda, uh, but I hope that it will be addressed at your next select board meeting as this is critical. The past several years have had fall town meetings in December. The warrants for those, these meetings have typically closed by late September. So time is of the essence. After watching recent school building committee meetings, Mr. Cohane, your representative from the select board on the school building committee, was tasked with items related to future scheduling of votes and ascertaining a list of design questions and concerns from the select board that the school building committee could address. So in closing, I urge the select board to move forward now with two things. Number one, scheduling a fall town meeting to continue the funding for the school building committee so they can plan for a solution to the decade long overcrowding in our schools. And number two, enumerating a list of your questions and concerns about the school project so that school building committee can address them. Thank you all for your service and for keeping in mind the needs of our school children. Thank you, Ada. That will conclude uh, public comment. Thank you all. So I think what we're going to do, there are two issues. So one, we have a public hearing scheduled, which is item number four. And then if it's okay with the members, I think I'd like to advance and go right into the governor's recess from the select board meeting, go into the governor's Stoughton meeting, deal with the Governor Stoughton agenda item, right, and then come back in the select board meeting. No All objections. Right? Okay, okay, okay. So given that, we're going to move to item number four, which is a public hearing, which is a liquor license amendment change of ownership interest LLC members, LL Partners, Trustees for Welch Restaurant Management, LLC, DBA, Abbey Park. And um, so I'm going to declare the public meeting is open. Mrs. McGettrick, you'll be presenting. Mrs. McGettrick will be presenting from the applicant. To be, then I'll allow any questions, comments from board members, questions or comments from the public. Ask for a motion to close the public hearing and then a roll call vote. Um, we're actually, are we doing two of them or just one? We should do them sequentially, so we'll do public hearing, then vote on the proposal. All right, so we're going to do two public hearings, so don't go away. <laughs> so for the record, on the change of ownership on item five, I'm going to abstain from the vote only because my college-age daughter Molly does work there in the summer, even though she's back at Syracuse now, and so full the full scopes, I won't vote on the Abbey Park one, but she doesn't work in the hour, so I'll vote on the one. So, given that, um, the hearing is open. Mrs. McGettrick, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Marion McGettrick. I'm representing both entities for both of these public hearings. Um, there is another attorney who filed the application who is much more um, experienced in 
corporate membership and, and all the details that go into this type of change of ownership. Um, but I'm sort of the local contact and I've represented both restaurants in the past. So I'm just going to very briefly summarize what this what this application is about. I won't talk long at all. Um, each Well, the first application is Welch Restaurant Management. Uh, they own Abbey Park Restaurant, and the application requests approval of a change of ownership for the uh, ownership entity, and that consists of the removal of one member, Anthony Dorenzo, and leaving in place all the other members. One of the remaining members will be purchasing the 5% share than Anthony Dorenzo held. So if you read the application through, you'll get these details. I don't know that it's of any particular public interest, but that is what this application is about. Mm -hmm. ABCC requires that any entity owning a liquor license report through a public hearing process on any change in the ownership. And this is considered a change in ownership because we're removing one member we're not adding any new members. We're leaving in place all the remaining members, but we are removing one. So that's what you are voting about. You'll be voting to allow us to make that change uh, to remove that member. Um, each license had the same ownership structure previously. After this change, each will still have the same ownership st structure, but they'll have one less member. Uh, so I, I don't I can speak again if you'd like on the second one, but it is exactly the same application with exactly the same names and exactly the same percentages. Um, and so I would say um, I'll leave it at that. That's what this is about. It, but if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them from anyone. So for the newer members who I think are going through this for the first time, we've, this is something that's happened. Whenever there's a change in a partnership or ownership, we've gone through this with other restaurants. The, the law does require public hearing to advise the public on our questions and comments for the change of ownership. It's This is a small percentage of the ownership where, as Mrs. Beatrix said, one of the current owners is now buying the share that the owner, the previous one is vacating. There's no outside person coming in. But it could be, an, and, and legally an outside person could, but in this case there isn't. So questions and comments from Mrs. Megatric, anything at all? Public, anyone online? I see no one online. So given that, uh, I'll ask for a motion to close this public hearing on item number four. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Motion made by Mrs. Musto. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. It's just, I'll it's just voice, right? Yeah, it's a voice. Yeah, it's yeah. a voice. Yeah. <laughs> I only heard yours as I looked around. So, um, and I'll abs I will abstain on that one. Yeah, so that's not on, right? That's um, that is that passes. I'm going to I'll, put, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. I'll um, make a motion to close the public hearing. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So okay. Now item number five. You have to declare that it's open again. Yeah, so I'm going to do it again. I'm going to, I'm going to go through the no, whole thing. Now we're on to approving the change, and you should recuse yourself on item number five. Oh, yeah, recuse myself. Oh, on so item this five. is just the vote, though. Yep. Okay, so now the motion here is going to. Um, tell me if I'm going wrong here. The move to approve the liquor so license. I'll, I'll move to approve the liquor okay. license change of ownership interest minority share Welch Restaurant Management LLC DBA Abbey Park. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'll abstain. Okay, now, and I got I went, was, was, okay, now this is item six. So now I'm going to declare the public hearing is open. Mrs. McGetrick, you don't have to say anything further. Um, the, so I would look to have a Mary, a move, a motion to close the hearing. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. I'll second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay, so the motion here would be to move to approve the liquor license change of ownership interest minority share 556 Adam Street, LLC, DBA, Navarra. I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Have a good night, Mrs. McGetrick. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> okay, so now I think, do I want a motion to recess? What do you think? I think I just, to cover yourself, I would do so I think I think I'd entertain a motion to recess 
from the regular select board meeting and enter into a meeting of the Governor Stone Trust. I'll make that motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay, so we're recessed from the select board meeting. We're now in the Governor Stone meeting. How do you remember these days, Mr. Sweeney? <laughs> do you remember Okay, so let me get to this now. Okay. So I'm going to call the Governor Stone. Um, on the Stoughton meeting to order. Item two is discussion update town farm review committee charge. I want to jump to my, hold on to this. I just want to get this quickly. There we go. Okay. So discussion, update, approval, town, farm review, committee, charge. Comments are from the members. No one? I will. Ms. Okay. Ms. Go, ahead. Stone, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, please. Um, then Mrs. I'll go to you afterwards, okay? Sure. Okay. Um, so we had a lot of people that came here tonight um, with the neighbors with concerns about the current charge um, that was made previously that we didn't, um, that we sent out RFPs before we heard from the residents and the neighbors. I, and given that this is, um, what did I write down here? Uh, the land is considered the 11th most endangered site according to the Mass Historical Commission. I think it's important that we really consider what goes there, the buildings and the land. Um, and I think that we should be open-minded to all options. So I think that should be, uh, the charge should be expanded. Good. This is all. Thanks. Um, just a couple of quick points. Um, so I, I, first of all, thank you everybody for coming out and speaking. I appreciate always hearing from, from people. I know we all do. Um, so it's not true that we sent the RFP out before uh, hearing from neighbors. As was stated pretty clearly, the RFP was put out on December 6th. We were listening to the neighbors in September. Um, and the neighbors did influence very strongly, actually, the RFP process. Um, we put in concerns from the neighbors around traffic into the RFP. We put in concerns around flooding into the RFP. Uh, we put in concerns about um, maintaining historical buildings uh, on the site, which were, again, raised by the neighbors, put in by the RFP, and put into the RFP. Uh, we put in uh, comments around, or requirements around construction noise and traffic abatement. Uh, and we also put in uh, comments around sidewalks and pathways, which is great, because I live in a house that doesn't have a sidewalk on my street. so. I feel great that we, you know, were able to do that. So, it's it's not really true. Um, and you know, again, I'm not trying to malign anybody or, or say anything's wrong or, or 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 argue. Just saying we had a, we had a long process about this. We talked to the attorney general. The attorney general agreed that this was a proper use of the land. Um, we have already sold off most of the town farm land. We had a number of really um, interesting and substantive conversations about um, the historic poor farm. Um, the will, for example, that left the poor farm uh, to uh, to Milton was, uh, you know, it was enacted in 1701. Uh, also included in the will uh, were was a, was a human being, a slave, um, was was given away as part of the will, uh, not to the town of Milton, fortunately. Um, but this is the, that sort of gives you the uh, an idea of the the historical nature and how long ago and how definitions have changed. If you ask to de define property. Uh, in 1701, property would have included human beings, uh, for example. So uh, we've had a long series of discussions on this. The RFP was put out in, in December. Um, we received responses in March. Um, this group uh, has not met again, um, not dis despite uh, you know, multiple requests for us to convene. Um, so now we're finally at this point, and uh, once again, folks are asking us to pause, rewind, go back, and reconsider things. And I I'm always curious about which, when we listen to, if we have four people that show up and ask for one thing, they, we, we have to pay attention. If we have 50 parents show up and ask for something, we have to not pay attention. So it's, it's always a bit of a balancing act here on the select board. But I will, I will say that I think it's, been, it's very clear that the town um, needs affordable housing. Uh, everyone agrees on that. Uh, it's very clear that affordable housing benefits folks that have lower than average median incomes, um, which I think you could use that to define poor. I think if you define poor person, in 1701, it would definitely be somebody that didn't own any property in Milton, so we wouldn't probably consider them a resident for those purposes either. Um, 
So we've had this process. It's gone on for a year and a half. We've listened to the neighbors. We made some substantive changes to the RFP. The, you know, the town doing business as the town had put this out in good faith. We had two great applications come in. And then, as everyone knows, as we've been told multiple times during the school building committee debate, construction costs go up uh, the longer that we wait. So we're costing time. Not only are we costing time, but whenever people complain about 40 bees being put in their neighborhood, the reason that they're being put there is because the town refuses to build its own affordable housing. And whenever we do that, it's because we're told that this isn't the right place, this isn't the right time, this isn't the right neighborhood. Um, and that is something that has been said multiple times. Um, fortunately for us, we know that this is the right time because we have an RFP that's been made and we've got folks that have responded to it. We know that this is the right place because this land is literally used for the benefit of the poor. Uh, and we know that uh, the longer that we wait on this, the more the construction costs will go up and also the less likely, and this is something I really have to emphasize, businesses are gonna wanna do business with this town. If we can't put an offer out there and then in good faith proceed on that offer, why would any, any sort of uh, company want to do business with this town if they know that at any given moment someone could say, well, is this the right time? Let's delay, let's, put, let's take more time to consider this. So all of that said, we don't have here as, uh, you know, th this is not about appointing a committee to review the use of the land. That is up to the governor's don't and trust how that land is used. We don't form an outside committee. We've already decided that we're using this land for affordable housing. I know that seats have changed and maybe people don't feel the same way uh, that, that pe or people that used to sit here, but we still have to do business as the town. And to not do that is really to not act in good faith. And it's going to damage our town in the long term. And it will continue to subject more residents to hostile 40 bs being put in neighborhoods where they also may not feel like it belongs with no input from the residents, with no input from the community, with no recourse at all. So in this case, we have the option of getting more community input, which we've already received and we can receive more. We have the land, it's the right time, we have the RFPs. Let's stop delaying, let's stop denying, and let's just move forward and do some business as the town. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, but, Mr. Yeah, after all that, I, I agree with Roxy and I'd like to look at expanding the charge. Is expanding the charge under a- uh, It is, so hold on. Okay. So is, is it, are you? I just wanted to add one thing that, um, as Governor Stoughton trustees, we have a responsibility to um, oversee this land and what goes there. And we have a responsibility to do that in the right manner. And so if that means that we relook at this, then I think that is the right thing to do. Doesn't mean that um, we have to narrow our path so narrow as another member here is suggesting. I think we have a responsibility to do what's right for that land as trustees and to do right for the poor of Milton. Thank you. Can I talk now? Yes. Sure? Okay. So, um, clearly I've been invested in this in a very long time. I was one of the original, part of a group, that was one of the original bidders that bid against Pulte. It was our goal then, um, as we were not, we are a nonprofit, and most people know who it is, but as a nonprofit, we bid our initial bid back in 2009, I think, 2008 long before I ever thought of coming in this room, um, was to try and preserve the 34 acres and um, rebuild the existing structures, the arms house, the men's arms house, and the pest house as affordable units, and to actually build a, not just a new animal shelter there, but also to build a new structure that would have been a permanent uh, location for the milk food pantry. That that was rejected on a three to one vote, I think, a two to one vote, and here's where we are. But I've always felt, and I remember having a discussion, not for the new members, but I remember being here as the Pulte project was progressing and, and a neighborhood was developing. I remember us having a discussion, I remember Mrs. Collins especially saying, there's going to be a neighborhood one day here, and they, much like the other about it, is Quisset Brook, um, and Indian Cliffs are going to want to, and the Governor Stone residents are going to have some type of say in this. So to the first point, I did have a conversation as chair with the Attorney General. 
and I, Ms. Musto was on it as well. And one of the things that I want to be very clear about is the Attorney General has not approved anything. He's not said this is a proper thing. She. He's not, she, she, well, the, the, the gentleman is, is Assistant Attorney General, John Green, is a gentleman. Um, he's not said, and I don't want to summarize everything, but he, two things that to me were very clear, he hasn't approved anything. And number two is that nobody, any bid, any request to include us, the gov Governor Stowe and trustees, to touch any of the five million and the principle of that money will be approved by them. Would, would I, am I summing that up correctly? Yeah. We can only yeah. work off the interest, which is the senior members of this board know, and we've pretty much spent just about every nickel each year giving to what they described as what they find to be appropriate needs of the poor, the needs of the world, which are primarily from us, the Milton Residence Fund and the Milton Food Pantry. A lot of people don't know where those are. They don't understand them. I talk about this a lot. My private life, for those who want to criticize me, come with me any day and I will clearly take you to places where you're going to see what poverty really is. And there is poverty in this community. You can ride around in a car all day long, you're not going to see it, but it's here. There's a reason why we have a Milton Food Pantry. So I understand that there were two proposals here. I did talk to the Fulbright Housing Chair, Julie Kramer, and I know how passionate she is and I know how much she cares about this. and. I have been here for the approval of nearly 700 units of affordable housing since I've been on this board, so I can't understand the process, what it takes. Um, some were good and some weren't so good, but we're in the position we're in. Um, for me personally, I'm fine with allowing the, uh, the committee that we're about to appoint to, as we had intended, to review these two proposals. But I'm also fine with allowing them to report back to us on other best practices that they think are better than those. Because I'll be very honest, I haven't died, I haven't died, I won't say dove, <laughs> looked deeply, <laughs> it's been a long day, <laughs> I haven't looked very deeply into these two proposals because I knew this was going to come. And this is a significant change and this, there is a definitely a historic, I do like one thing, I, will, I did like the fact that both proposals both developers did propose maintaining the existing structures. That's something I know Steve O'Donnell's cared a great deal about. And I know that for the nonprofit that I sit on, that was something that we cared about. And, you know, history, once you tear things down, there's no getting them back. So uh, I'm fine. M my suggestion would be to appoint this committee, ask them to evaluate the two RFPs and allow them, if they do not find that these RFPs meet the, either the needs, and this will be our decision, but to at least report back to us on, on a, any other alternatives, or any other suggestions that they think are better that meet the needs of the will, I'm fine with, with expanding that charge. And I'm. this may be something that maybe we want to let Peter put a couple of words to. I'm just expressing a broader view. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and it may be that everyone decides these are, but I'm for giving these a butt as a voice because this is a historic aspect of the town. To the one point that the gentleman made is, is the former chair of the traffic commission for 10 years and having been to that, to that animal shelter on more times than I can count, pulling out of Governor Stoughton Lane on a Camden Avenue is a significant, significant cause for caution, if I, if I were to use a term. Um, I don't want to scare anyone. So that would be where I'm at. And I will make a motion that I, we- Before we move, can okay, I- no, can Okay, no, okay, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Um, so just a quick uh, question and then um, a quick thought, and then I'm happy, whatever your uh, motion is. So the, the question I have, uh, Mr. Wells, is when did you and, and Ms. Musto uh, talk with the Attorney General, the Assistant Attorney General? Last week? Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, Thursday. Thursday. okay. Is there a it, was, it was only because we waited for them. We they we waited till they would okay. talk we, to us. I you know I think it, it's great that you you spoke with them. I think having a meeting of the trustees in advance of that so that we could maybe have put some you know thoughtful questions together for you guys to have. That didn't happen a lot of time when the prior chair met with. The, I had no input in that. So I think it was Mr. Milano that met, met with them last. But that's that's fine. That's just a quick question. Uh, second point is uh, I don't think anybody here is advocating not having uh, a butters on this committee. So that's you know, totally fine, obviously. 
Um, my suggestion would be because the lack of affordable housing currently impacts folks everywhere from East Milton to West Milton, which is a place, uh, to North and South Milton. So I would recommend that we think about, and I know that we had applications from Dania Raphael, who is a former member of the Affordable Housing Trust, and a woman of color, who would be the only person of color on this panel, um, as it's currently proposed, um, that we could consider her and or Carolyn Cahill, who also wrote to the town administrator expressing interest in participating in the process and is of course involved in the Chamber of Commerce uh, and the real estate market. So given that both of them have significant expertise in the field, I think it would behoove us as a town so that if we're giving residents a voice, we're not just giving residents who abut, of course we are giving them a voice, but that we're also considering folks who A, understand the broader impact of not building affordable housing in town and B, understand the, the RFP process and might be able to provide some great advice or guidance or questions to the process. I think it would behoove us as a town to make sure that we're being truly representative, uh, including people of color on boards or committees that we appoint, particularly when, uh, well, in, in, in any circumstance. So um, those would be my, that would be my suggestion as we think about the makeup of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. So I did see those texts to Mr. Milano and I saw the suggestion where they came from, and I'm fine with that. That's everyone's right, and I appreciate that. But to me, as I've said all along, my concern in this situation is that I wanted to see a committee, me personally, I wanted to see a committee of the neighborhoods that about this to allow them to weigh on this. This is going to have a direct impact on them. This is a historical change. I've never wavered on this from since the day they first I first reviewed the first RFP that came out in 2009. I've thought about this repeatedly, and while I appreciate your comments on it, that's just, to me, this is about the neighborhood, and that's right. I think there's more than enough expertise and diversity in that neighborhood to meet the issues that you just brought up. So, so given that, um, I'm going to make a motion to approve the Town Farm Review Committee ch charge that will include the review of the two RFPs set forth by the two um, responders to the RFP and to um, also include that if in fact that there is an alternative proposal that they want to come forward with that they may also do that and review any other alternatives that meet the needs, what we believe is the needs of the trust. And Attorney Miller can put that in, in language. So do I have a second on that motion? I'll second that. Second by Ms. Musto. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Three in the affirmative, one in nay, and the, the motion passes. Okay. So now let's go to the discussion approval of the appointees, the appointment of the Town Farm Review Committee members. From the Governor Stoughton Trust, one trustee, and I understand Ms. Musto has suggested to Mr. Milan that she's interested. Uh, Mr. Wells. Yes. yes. Sorry, I, I, I'm assuming we're, is this open for discussion or? I'm just reading them. I'm okay. Just, no, I'm just reading so for them. the Governor Stoughton Trust, I, I know when we had this conversation in March, um, we had decided that because we, MPEG we is represented we, and Affordable Housing Trust is represented, and both Ms. Musto and I sit on that that neither one of us would put our names forward. If that's changed, then that is changed. That's, so that, that's, that's, that's something that hasn't been uh, discussed uh, among this group in an open meeting. We can that do that. Changed. I'm just, I just suggested okay. I didn't, no, that's what, I'm, I'm, I'm just, just putting just that out there that this, you seem to be aware of a change that I'm not aware of. On the chair, I had an agenda prep meeting with Mr. Milano, okay. like just from the Affordable Housing Trust, Mr. Callahan, from the Planning Board, Meredith Hall, from the Historic Commission's Chair, Steve O'Donnell, from the Master Plan Implementation Committee, um, Cheryl Tagayas, and the residents that uh, represent the neighborhoods. I have a list of Michael Kelly, Richard Williams, Susan Ferrari, Manche Mary Blanchett, Morgan Salmon, and Maggie Wilson. Mr. Chair, on, um, in terms of Quisset Brook, because Brook had uh, several people put their names forward. So I knew that. And I spoke to Mr. Williams, who's the current president of the corp corporation, and he suggested himself um, as the direction from Quisset Brook as the neighborhood. Um, so we had listed the names because of those are the names and hadn't been given one, but I did follow up with him today. Mr. Milano? Yes. Um, I know that uh, folks were asked to submit a written application to, to uh, register their interest in this committee. Is, did that happen for all of these folks? 
what had happened is we reached out to folks in the neighborhoods in each of the neighborhoods and asked them to send us names of people who would be interested. It wasn't, um, we didn't request them to fill out any specific application. Okay, so, so um, because I was told uh, if we were having folks that were interested that they needed to put a letter forward to you expressing their interest and why they wanted to participate in the committee. I have, I everybody so. has done so. And okay. On this, that has Do we been have those here. materials to review for these residents? I can share. We don't They're mostly just emails that said I would be interested in serving. Oh, well, I'm just wondering because it sounds like we've already made up our minds about who we're appointing. So I'm, it, it's nice for transparency's sake to have on record um, who's said what about whether they'd like to join and what they're interested in. You finished? I, okay. I, it was a question for Mr. Milano and Mr. Wells. So I want to respond. Oh, so okay. The neighborhoods had many, all the neighbors wanted to put more than one resident. And so what I suggested to Mr. Milano was, out of fairness, to represent everyone, one representative from each location. So one representative from Quissel Brook who wanted three, one representative from the residents of Woodlaw Drive, one representative from the residents of Gunner Stone, and one representative from the largest neighborhood, which is the neighborhood of Indian Spring. So if, if you want to change that, but I'm, fine with that. I wasn't sure. I knew that um, Quisip Brook especially wanted more than one and, and Mr. Milano handed it and to me he just addressed it. Can, can I? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I, the last point then on the residents is that you know I, I know uh, of the residents that are listed here uh, only uh, Ms. Blanchett has really reached out to the Affordable Housing Trust uh, to engage in the process. So to the extent that I can as the representative from the Affordable Housing Trust to the Select Board, um, I would recommend uh, that uh, Mary Blanchett be appointed as one of the residents. She is also, um, I think, along with one of the gentlemen in the audience, uh, immediately adjacent to the uh, to the property. So you want to give Quisset Brook two, two residents? I think that it would actually make more sense to give Quisset Brook two, and, I'm, and Indian Cliffs is a huge neighborhood. I mean, I don't know where you draw the line of where, where the abutting starts, but I think Quisset Brook and Woodlot are or um, the the uh, pull, the uh, those would be the neighborhoods that I would I would do two from Quisset and I would do one from Quisset. that's my that's my thinking. I don't. Otherwise, I, I want to be fair. Like, look, you know, everyone know I'm all about fairness. I I'm trying to be fair and give every single entity a voice here that has concern on this. I mean, we could have done three or four. I'm just trying to. And the other thing is, I'm trying to move this along. One of the things that we do have is we have, in your words, we have two developers that have put two RFPs forward and are waiting to hear. So win, lose, or draw, I think they deserve to have their the, the merits of their proposals reviewed. I totally agree. So unless anyone objects, I'd recommend that we go forward with the names that I've put forward with the exception of that I will recommend that um, Ms. Musto serve as the the, I'll make a motion that Ms. Musto serve as the representative of the Governor Stone Trust. I second that motion. Okay. I just, for the, for the record, I would like to point out that Ms. Bradley and Mr. Wells were both nominated for the know, representatives both... uh, in March. And Ms. Musto and I recused ourselves. That's fine. So noted. So, uh, you... I just was going to add that I don't recall that I ever, I, it was not a vote. Yeah, it wasn't. A, we there wasn't. There, I went there was back no formal to, vote. We, we didn't vote. We talked we about it. We, 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 we yes, vote. I know there wasn't a formal vote, but it was very clear in the discussion that you and I were not going to participate in it. And it was uh, Ms. Bradley and Mr. Wells, because you serve on MPIC, I serve on Affordable Housing Trust. People can watch the tape and make their own decisions. But there was not, I was not okay. part of that okay. decision. Thank okay. you. Let's but just some stuff for clarification, Mr. Let's, Wells, let's the res on. do you have the residents that, which are the residents from the list that you're reading are the ones that you're proposing because there's Michael Kelly, Richard okay. Williams, Morgan Salmon, and Maggie Wilson. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. That covers yeah. all four neighborhoods. Okay. So, and I, I would like to make a motion that we I include have a one resident. I made a motion. I second okay. that. All right. Can, I've got a motion on the floor. So, but I, I can I make a friendly floor. amendment to your motion or amend, amendment to your motion? What's the amendment? I move that we appoint one resident at large from Milton. Uh, with knowledge of the affordable housing process to serve as an, as an additional resident voice. Is there a second on that? You don't have a second, Mr. I don't see a second. I would not say. I, I, I don't. I'm I, don't trying, I, don't I, know, I know what you're trying to do, um, 
but I want to move this forward. And I'm, I'm all for moving forward, okay. Mr. Chair. So you, there's, is there a second on the friendly amendment? There is not. So the friendly amendment is defeated. So now the motion on the floor is to appoint the four residents, Michael Kelly, Richard Williams, Morgan Salmon, and Maggie Wilson as residents to the Town Farm Review Committee charge. That's second. It's already been second. Yeah, all those, yeah. all those, yeah. in, all those right. in favor. Sorry. Aye. 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 Opposed? No, because I haven't seen any uh, paperwork That's on any fine. of the residents. That's fine. Thank you all. So and now, excuse me. Go, ahead. go ahead. Did we appoint everybody else then officially? Did it take oh, a I think we do. Okay, so now I'm going to go through. I'm going to make a motion to approve from the Governor Stoughton Trust, one, uh, Roxanne Musto, from the Affordable Housing Trust, Tom Callahan, from the Planning Mr. Board. Chair, uh, let me be, just finish. From okay. the Planning Board, Mr. Hall, Meredith Hall, from the Historical Commission, Steve O'Donnell, and from the Master Plan Implementation Committee, Charlotte Tagayas. Do I have a second? I'll second. Mr. Second. Chairman, please. Go ahead. The uh, Affordable Housing Trust Planning Board, Historical Commission, Master Plan Implementation, Implementation Committee all voted on their appointees. I think what's what we should do is vote on our appointee and then vote for the rest as a slate. <laughs> We're going to vote as a slate. That, that's, they have if to we do that, then us. I have to vote now. Okay, that's fine. All those in favor? All Aye. those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Yes, no. I'm a no. So you're no yeah, on the I'm appointees yes, of the other appointees. Okay, very good. Okay. I'm specifically no on our Governor Stoughton trustee. Okay. Now. I'll make a motion to close unless we have another item to do. So I'm going to move to adjourn. Are you going to move to adjourn? Yeah, move to adjourn the Governor I'll Stoughton trust. I'll second. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Sorry for the static and um, good luck. Um, you'll all have to get sworn in before you can have a meeting, before anyone can vote. You'll, um, you'll get a letter from Mr. Milano. Each member, regardless of what position they're in now, must go to the town clerk's office and get sworn in first before you can actually t um, have a meeting and, and vote. But thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, so now I'm going to move, make a motion to return to the regular session. Do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so now we're back Aye. in. Sorry. I got, I got that back. Yes. Thank you. So now we're at <laughs> item we're gonna go to eight. Item eight. We're going to hold on the bond sale. We're going to go to item come back. nine. We'll Still come talking back to the kids. Okay, so item nine is discussion update. East Milton Fire Station. Our fire station morning committee chair, Mr. Walsh. You bring Mr. Solomon to just you're good on this. <laughs> good evening, welcome. Thank, thank you, you for your patience. Thank you. thank you for your time. Congratulations on headquarters. Oh, thank and you. thank you for on behalf of us, this this board and the prior boards mm -hmm. that I've sat here with over these past many years, for all the efforts that your committee has taken and put forth to get us to where we are. This is, as you know. We've spent a lot, a lot of hours together, you and I, and your, this has taken an awful lot of work. This is a, a unique situation in everything from the design, the development, and especially the funding, uh, trying to, to, to get funding to match so that we're able to develop and build these head, these <coughs> new facilities without um, going outside what has been allowed or allotted to us under the early amendments. So that's my two seconds for you tonight and the rest is to you. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, and, and, and I'll just take the opportunity to, to thank each and every one of you, members of the board. Having spent a long time active resident and town meeting member, I think for 35 years, uh, I know it takes a lot of work and, and a lot of times it's thankless. You know, you're trying to make great decisions and you're working hard uh, and the effort is appreciated and not, not just by someone else who's been involved in other boards or committees, but I think by many, many residents. So thank you. And Mr. Chair, I'm not sure, I, I didn't uh, know if you, I, I understood you might be discussing the uh, fate of the current East Milton Station. If you want a, just a brief little update as to where we are. Yeah, that would start and then we can go from there on timing and what you, what you. All right, terrific, okay. thank you. So first of all, in regards to the brand new headquarters station, I'd like to use this opportunity to share with you and the community. We did attempt as we were finished 
opening the section where you know everyone, it could start being used. We attempted to have a community day. We opened it up to everybody on a Saturday, but it wasn't well advertised and well structured. So we agreed as a committee that we would in fact have a public uh, viewing day and, and sort of formal opening of the station. We are, in, as, as uh, Mr. Lano knows, we, we are right about technically being finished. I know, I was there today. <laughs> and so, uh, and we are meeting as a committee, Fire Station Building Committee on uh, September 3rd. Uh, not that it's not a busy day in the town, you know, full election I won't be going on. <laughs> but, uh, we, <laughs> but we're meeting then because we're trying uh, our best to get the East Milton Station uh, <clears throat> going forward. So I'll make sure that we uh, have an agenda item where we discuss and hopefully establish a, uh, a grand opening day, if you will, from the headquarters. Ironically, it's behind uh, the town hall, mm -hmm. and it doesn't get seen by a lot of residents, you know, riding by. Uh, and I, and it's, I think it's unfortunate because I think it looks spectacular, but I'm, a little, I'm, I'm definitely biased. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it, I think it'll be great to do that. And then secondly, as I just referred to, we're real close at being able to determine what we're going to do in potentially issuing uh, the RFPs for the East Milton Station, which will be located on property directly next to the St. Agatha's Rectory. So if you're on uh, Adam, Street. Adam Street, you look just directly mm -hmm. to the left of the St. Uh, Agatha's Rectory, That's, that'll be there. Um, we have, it's delineated a little bit by, we have already put in a new exit driveway, if you will, in the property. We were asked as part of the uh, purchase and sales agreement to do that during July and August, so it would not interfere, build that e exit driveway, so it would not interfere with the kids in, in school. We did do that last summer. Uh, we're hoping to be well underway in construction during the school year. And uh, Mr. Chair, if, if you're comfortable, I'd be happy to come in at a future date when we have sort of tangible dates as to what and when we're going to do East Milton. Uh, I'd love to share that with the, the committee and, and the community. So for the members, this is, I was trying to think historically today, I believe, I can't think of one. I think there's going to be the first newly constructed building since this building here, am I right? Since this, because the schools were all within existing structures, um, headquarters. Well, I guess you could. You headquarters is stuck, in a way, it's a, it's brand new, but it's like a, an offshoot of a historic structure. Um, this is a new site. I this mean, is going to be yeah, a new site right. with a brand new building. I think, like this, I think it may be the first one since the COA oh, was built. That's a good and, point. Um, so for the board members. There are some options we are going to have. Just, I'm only saying this to think about it tonight. We're going to have to look, and you can tell me if I go off course here. We will have to look to dispose of, or rent, or lease, or whatever, the existing engine to. Um, I think that's a discussion we need to have sooner versus later, and it might be viable to have you or the, I don't know who it is, to come in and kind of paint the picture to the, <clears throat> decaying condition, you know, just, just the condition, why it's no longer viable as a fire station or sure, what yeah. it is that we would be I'd leasing, be happy to do that tonight yeah. if you like, and it won't, I won't take up much go ahead, of your time. Go ahead, you can kind of, because I don't think a lot of the members know. Yeah, this, so, so so ironically, we had, you know, going, when this project started, we had three fire stations in Milton, and when this project is done, we'll still have three fire stations. Two of them were well more than 100 years old, including the headquarters. In fact, they were some of the oldest fire stations in the country. Um, the newest one is actually Engine 2 station in East mm. Milton Square, uh, the one we're, we're about to replace. The irony, the irony of that being the newest one, is it, uh, it was being constructed and wrapped up in the, in the early 1950s, uh, about 1951, <clears throat> and then come along later in the 1950s, the state and the federal government decided to sink the expressway mm. uh, and dramatically changed the whole traffic flow down in East Milton. It really, it, you know, it, it, it put a canyon between, you know, 75% of the town, if you will, and the, 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 the section across Quincy. I strongly believe, and just to, I, I like to reiterate, reiterate this uh, anytime we get on the subject, because I, I think it's important. 
I strongly believe had that expressway been sunk before the decision was made by the town to rebuild, by the way, there was another station there, mm. uh, but to rebuild on that site, they would not have. And the reason is 75% of the district that that fire station covers is on, let's call it the Milton side of the expressway. Uh, and it takes a, a minimum of a minute, but more like a minute and a half for those engines to leave East Milton Station and get over to the post office. At my, I like to use this expression, even at my advanced age, I could probably throw a rock <laughs> from East Milton Fire Station and hit Absolutely. the post office. Mm -hmm. But don't test me on it. <laughs> Tomorrow, 10 o'clock, we'll meet you on the deck. <laughs> you get three warm ups. <laughs> I can see it now assaulting a federal building. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't use a rock. No, I'm not going there. <laughs> anyway, um, and just a, a little aside so you know, um, the current location, the new location uh, is a dramatic improvement. And even in response time for both the 25% of the district that's on the Quincy side and significantly for the 75% of the district, because on the Milton side, they'll come out on the bright wide uh, roadway, i.e. Adams Street, that has clear visibility sight lines on both sides get out and they can quickly feed to 75% of the district on this side. And then if they have to, service the residents on the Quincy side of the expressway. They're able to come out, take a right, take a right again on West Quantum Street. And frankly, that's a wider and easier road to then go up and feed off the side streets to get to those residents. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that Adams Street, uh, yeah, Adams Street in East Milton is very crowded. You know, people are double parking, it's tight. You know, there's a lot of businesses there, so the parking is usually taken up. So for the, the engines to come out and then get up Adam Street quickly to service some of those can be slow. Most people that we've talked to at the analysis that we've had done said it will be faster using uh, West Guam Street. Okay, so that's a, I'm sorry. Did you so are we still talking to construct engine two like a nine to 10 month project? I I, I, yeah, I would say that's a, a fairly uh, a good estimate. Uh, you know, it, a whole year, probably when you put it out to bid, right. get through that. We did we did do, uh, went through a whole pre-qualification process, basically to, it's, it's an early awareness to potential bidders of what's gonna be involved. Uh, they have to formally go through review and submit their interest. It would have been reasonable to expect as few as three uh, acceptable responses to that, informal responses to that. Mm. We got 12. <clears throat> and that's terrific because I think when we go out to bid, it's going to help. It's sort of an indicator that there's a real appetite out in the uh, in the construction world for more projects, and that should should help us with our pricing. Uh, but yes, yeah, so Ch Mr. Chairman, I think you know we're sitting here. It's basically we're almost in September. Uh, my hope and goal would be that we will be all done and occupied before next September. So I definitely won't be chair next September. What I'd like to do, though, in my time that I am chair this year is to try and at least start to put on our radar that we start to look at how we're going to dispose of this, whether it's a sale, whether it's a lease. And if whatever it is, if we do issue an RFP or something before this, this that whoever the buyer or the, or the leasee is, that they allow us to be the tenant until the move time. Well, and so we, if, 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 if you... If you like, go ahead. I have strong opinions <laughs> regarding that. Kidding me? <laughs> no, I, honestly, look. No, no, I, that's why I wanted you to come here. <laughs> so, starting with, and in, in, uh, Mr. Wells sort of referenced it, the current station, even though the newest station, we actually had it had a, a uh, in-service engine, and then it was also storing a, an old a ladder truck in there. Um, by the way, originally when it was service, you know, the fire department had a ladder track. Well, we were St. Agatha's kids. There was both a ladder. It was engine two and ladder two in that firehouse. There, there you go. Uh, and so we had to actually take the second truck out of that building because as, you know, we were working on this project, all of a sudden we became aware of the fact that the floor, the lintel edge of, of the, where the door is, if you will, the, 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 the trucks was sinking. It, it, it could have, if we continue to use it and did nothing, could have collapsed. So we did do an emergency repair. We worked with the town uh, 
our town T DPW department, still represented here by one terrific DPW leader, I might add. Um, they, you know, they worked with us and we did do an emergency repair. We no longer keep a second truck in there and, and, and never will. Uh, and we're hoping and expecting to get through the time that we needed for the active truck before we'd have to worry about other repairs. But in my opinion, just as I'll start with as a resident town meeting member, <clears throat> I don't think that that bill, I think it's going to need major repair if you want to retain it and use it for something else for the town in the future. I think it would be an expensive undertaking. And uh, again, it's going to have issues that the fire department faces, like ridiculous traffic jams in, in the area uh, and, and others. So I, I, as a resident in a long time, I would like to see the town sell it rather than sink a bunch of money into it and, and try to find a purpose that may not work well. On the other hand, the private sector, ironically, still does have interest in that location. Mm. In fact, you know, there have been times in the past, banks have expressed interest to the select boards about, hey, would you, you know, consider getting rid of that property? We're interested. Um, we, we had uh, Webb Collins on our committee, uh, a senior member of the uh, largest real estate uh, company in the world. He'd had them do an evaluation, and this is about two years old now. And uh, they, they maintained that building would be worth the town getting rid of a million dollars, and, and probably more, to, you know, depending. So and even though it's tough to be repaired and fixed for us, uh, it has enough value to the private sector because of its location that it would bring in revenue. And <clears throat> now, in complete open honesty, I would love to see the town sell it, period. But I especially would like to see the town sell it because we may find ourselves in need of some of those funds huh. to squeeze in and get the East Milton fire station completed within the limits of uh, the special uh, purpose stabilization fund, or IE as in Milton known as the, the Hurley Amendment. We're, we're, not we're not raising any residence taxes. It's using the declining debt from the school building project in the Milton Library to fund the construction of, of the fire stations. Uh, we know, it's no surprise, uh, that we're, we're gonna have to come back to the town for more funds. There's more available to us with that special purpose stabilization funds, uh, but before we take on the, the last project, which will be Atherton. So I didn't digress a little. But no, I, we, I, 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 I'm glad you said it because I knew this was coming, so I'm glad you brought that up. So not that we're gonna do anything on it tonight, but we knew. Yeah. We knew that was coming, so, okay. Yeah, and so, uh, uh, you know, if you had any questions, I'd be happy. I'm lobbying to sell that station. I may be lobbying stronger if we find we're all set to go and we're shot a little. Uh, and by the way, just an observation, we, you, like everything in life, when you get involved with something, you learn a lot more about it than you would have known otherwise. Um, there are towns that have done similar things like us. You can sell that. Mm and we can still use it until it's uh, completed. So there's all kinds of arrangements you could make. Uh, I'm floating that idea. I, I, I was aware, <laughs> that's why I said that, we, that we become a tenant if we were to sell yep. it, and then we remain a tenant until we're ready to move into the new, the, the new, the new one, engine correct. too. So perhaps maybe at the next meeting you could bring forth this week just to kind of paint a picture as to how we should move forward on this, if this is what we're gonna do. Yes, I, I think, you know, putting an RFP together is light lifting in the sense of putting the pieces together. Mm. The hard parts of it are kind of what does the board want to evaluate in mm. terms of does it care just about purchase price? Does the board care about selling, but it also, hey, we like the building and we want the new tenor, tenant to keep the building as is. Do we want to lease it and, main, and hold on to the land? Um, those are the kind of things that shape how we would write an RFP and especially how we would shape the evaluation criteria. So um, for the next meeting, I can give an example and ahead of time some examples of what RFPs might look like. But really, the fundamental question are, do we want to keep it, get highest price, and have no restrictions on what happens to the building after the facts? Um, do we want to say there's preferences for keeping the building? Do we want to 
only lease it. So those kind of big fundamental questions we would need real clarity on before being able to progress an RFP very far. And maybe it's something we're thinking about and having that discussion at the next meeting and then letting us go to work on writing and putting that criteria together. I'm fine with that. The one I know, I know it. Chia Walsh is at on selling it because I think if we keep it, we're going to have to put no. If we were, to, when you're talking serious money right. to what Agreed. we would do, with it. but I do, and I, I'm sure Steve O'Donnell will hear or Meredith or people who really care about the history that there will be some care to keep. I mean, to me, I look at the old headquarters now. It's like amazing. It's just and so, I think you could do something very similar with ease. You know, while keeping that, sure. and so I, I, I'm open. At least me, I'm, I'm open to whatever you want to go. Other members may think differently. Whatever you want to. No, no comments. Go ahead. I'm looking at you. I know you're looking. <laughs> right I'm wondering why I can tell you want to say so. Like, go ahead. So Sorry, I, my bad. I would. No, you're fine. I think it's good to keep the options open. I mean, there's a place in um, Boston. I think it's Division 16. It was an old firehouse and restaurant. So, I mean, I think there are creative things that could happen. And I wonder if, you know, somebody would, would if we retained the property, would somebody come in and do a build out, you know, and, and that's an option too. So I think we just, I would just like us to keep our options open, whether it's, you know, instead of selling it, you know, maybe that is what we do, but let's look at also, would somebody be interested in doing a build out of that and, um, you know, leasing it from the town or something. Build so I think it, it sometimes... Build it, uh, build it, make it bigger? No, no, no. Sometimes you'll have somebody that will go in and they'll they'll demo it and then they'll, that will be like their space. Um, so I, I think just to keep the options open would be good. Yeah, if I can, Mr. Go ahead, Mr. Chair, Mr. I, I agree with Ms. Musto. I, particularly when we look at the, when we, there was looking at the, uh, the DCR property, over by the uh, the Mattapan uh, Rotary, I can't remember the number of the property. Seven, seven Brush Hill. Road. Um, there, one of the options was, you know, to like for a tenant to receive a discounted lease in exchange for like renovating or repairing a building. And so, you know, I, I agree. I think keeping our options open right now is is, is a good idea. And I think, you know, the possibility of perhaps leasing it and then providing like a subsidized lease so that they repair the building. The main, town maintains property, but we don't lose money on it. I think that could make sense. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, uh, uh, Paul. I just one thing since we looked at extensively. One thing I'd also just bring to your attention: and it does it doesn't influence it one way or the other. But the real problem with that location is parking. Yes. Yeah. The, the lot is so tiny. Even Two if spaces. we didn't have a problem yeah, with the floor collapsing mm. and the traffic, and those are real problems. Uh, building a firehouse to accommodate the Engines now are getting bigger, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. We only have, they only have three firefighters that can park their car. They squeeze it in there. Uh, one, so, one, one goes sideways against the building, the other two back in against it. That's right. Yeah, it's a tough one. But, yeah. but you know, residents have recommended to me, knowing I'm on the fire station building committee, that it would be a great spot for a firehouse subs. No, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. So I, I'm fine with bringing to us any, but I, I do know, I mean, I've sat through all these meetings. I mean, from the point of trying to look at it to keep it as a firehouse to Mr. Collins's, you know, in detailed presentations about, and then listening to um, Bill Ritchie before, you know, the prior about the level of work. And I just think that we need to, because the last thing I want to see happen is build engine two, they move out and two years from now, we're talking about what are we going to do with that building? I don't think that does it, that's not going to serve and which is why being involved in your committee, I said to Mr. Milano, we need to start talking about it, this and looking at this now versus a year from now when you're gone and it's sitting there all boarded up and people are gonna say, what do you, it's, and it's it's unlike the Mac or even Seven Brush, or even Seven Brush Road's on a slab, it doesn't have that, but it's unlike yeah. the Mac or the Discovery School, which were, that were functional that you could use, um, you know, apps in a, a firehouse sub one, I mean, absent maybe Valvoline <laughs> could go in there and do oil change. They take, I mean, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it, it has some real issues to what it's going to be able to use that. But I'm, I'm fine with this. Can I back throw out right. another suggestion? And Nick reminded me that it was something that we talked about too, is if the board's not really kind of clear on exactly what it's looking for, we could do something similar to what Seven Brush Hill Road is doing under DCR's stewardship is where they're just putting out a request for expression of interest. Mm -hmm. So we could, say, give us your ideas, 
as kind of a first step here and give people six weeks to turn around, have something back in hand, you know, October, November timeframe, and then use that to inform the RFP. So not kind of bind ourselves to an RFP at this point, but take a first step, put out an expression of interest, reach out to fund developers or other parties that people have spoken to in the past about it, get some ideas, see what those are, and then use that to inform what we write for an RFP. It'll slow the process of, down a bit, but maybe it gives you some better ideas um, to make decisions uh, more quickly down the road. Clear with that? I, I, I think that's a good, particularly considering how much the real estate market's fluctuated yeah. the last two years, I think it would make a lot of sense. I like that okay. idea too. Yeah, okay. sounds good. So that we can certainly prepare and have ready to go for the next meeting, and then we'll get that out shortly thereafter. Okay. okay. It's, and, and just so you know, I have my, I, my own opinions as a resident, <laughs> but I fully support whatever you do. I realize that you folks have a lot on your plate and you're trying to make the best decisions for the town. We're grateful for the support you've given to us as a fire station building committee and do whatever you think is best for the town. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. I also, Gina, you here for moral support? I also want to recognize Mr. Sullivan. Gene Sullivan <laughs> sits an original member of the fire station building committee, a dedicated member of the fire station. I saw him tour. I think I've seen him twice in the last two weeks tour on the new headquarters. He didn't see me. I was in the second floor looking out the window. But thank you, Gene. Um, okay, item number 10, discussion approval contract amendment with Vertex for owner's project management services for the East Milton fire station project. Oh, no, but wait, that's coming. We're coming back. That's no, coming. no, we should do this. We'll so do this okay. is, um, Vertex is the current project manager uh, that oversaw the headquarters project. The Fire Station Builder Committee has recommended approval of this contract amendment. This amendment would cover their services, beginning with bidding for East Milton through construction administration and through closeout. Um, it's about $848,000 for all of those services. It's already accounted for in the project right. budget. Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion? Um, Motion's right here. I'll make it. I'll make the motion that we approve. Um, where is it? Contract amendment. Contract for Vertex. Am amendment for Vertex. For Ocean Pro Owners for Project Owners Management right. Services, right here. You got it right there. Oh, I've got it right there. That's it. Okay, for Owners Project Management Services for the East Milton Fire Station Project. Do I have a second. second. Second by Mr. Zoll. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> okay, item number. I see Mr. Berkeley here. Do you want to jump to that? Yeah, it's, it's next now, actually, 11. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm writing all over my sheets tonight. <laughs> mm. <Okay>. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to item 11 is discussion approval the water and sewer rates for fiscal year. 2025 that will be in July of this year, correct? No, so uh, good evening, Mr. Chair. Oh, they won't. All right. So yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. sorry. So Chase Berkeley, Director of Public Works. So uh, w the rates we're setting tonight are recording stock. This current fiscal year. So um, we have uh, July bills to send out. That these recording in progress. So um, with that, so uh, thank you, everyone. Nice to see everybody. Uh, with me tonight is Todd Prokup from the uh, firm Wooded and Current. Wooded and Current is an engineering firm that's been doing the town's water and sewer rate analysis for probably 15 years now. Um, they have a, a long dedicated history and um, lots of institutional knowledge about our system. Um, they also do a lot of work to design and oversee our construction projects. Um, so they're you know involved in the debt service side of the business too. So uh, Milton is a MWA community, Mass Water Resource Authority. So we take in water from the state's system water coming from the Quabbin Reservoir, Wachusa Reservoir, in their treatment facilities. We bring it in uh, to town, it's metered. Uh, so on the, on the water side, we pay exactly what enters the town. It's measured by the gallon. Um, and then we uh, distribute it to our properties and then collect it on the sewage side. Uh, the sewage is collected, transported to the Deer Island treatment plant where it's cleaned and sent out to the ocean. And so we pay uh, for that treatment on the sewer side. Sewer calculations are a lot more complicated. It's more like an electric bill than, than the water bill. So uh, they take into uh, account population, um, the, the maximum monthly flow. So rain is a big influencer of sewage flows. So you have to, uh, the MWRA balances what Milton produces versus all the other communities. So yeah, and they look at a three-year average as opposed to actually looking at the, 
the uh, flows that entered in that calendar year. So uh, the tricky part in, in why, why we use a rate consultant is um, the MWA assesses us per calendar year. We, we operate on a fiscal year. And so their bill is 18 months behind when we actually use the water. So our FY25 rates are paying our calendar 23 water consumption. So we're, we don't know exactly how much water we're gonna sell this year, but it needs to raise enough money to pay the bill to the MWRA. So that's, that's the finesse that, that's required. And it, it makes the time frame a little tight where we need to see what happened at year end as far as revenues come in and then um, design a rate to break even to be able to raise that revenue requirement. So the goal is always to make the, the rates as low as possible for the residents. So um, we, we designed them to just break even and, and no more than that. So um, Todd has a presentation, a uh, quick few slides. It's gonna walk through how we arrived at the numbers tonight. And then uh, you know, obviously happy to take any questions following that, if that works for you guys. Go ahead. All right. You should have it now. We got it. Just move the microphone over. Thanks. Thanks very much, folks. So uh, thanks, Chase. Uh, as Chase mentioned, my name is Todd Prokop from Woodard and Curran. Um, been doing this for a few years, looking at, at water sewer rates in Milton. Um, and so we've just got a, a quick presentation. Um, and the, basically, we're going to run through water expenses, sewer expenses, and then how we arrived at our, uh, the proposed rates here. Um, so most of, uh, I guess all the, the costs there uh, and revenues from the right-hand side, those are all uh, what was approved at the town meeting um, a few months ago. Uh, so, so that's where all those come from. And again, as Chase mentioned, we're looking at, you know, just trying to level fund, trying to cover the costs that are anticipated to, to occur uh, in this fiscal year. Um, in, in order to do that, we need to be able to predict how many gallons of water the town is going to sell and, and how many gallons of sewage the town's going to have to dispose of. Um, and so we look at annual averages and, and sort of overall trends to do that. Um, in this case, uh, when we look at the expenses, um, water expenses are down slightly, 1.4%. Uh, it's not much, but it's something. Um, driven largely by a decrease in the MWA assessment um, and uh, some debt service falling off. You can see there's small increases in directs and indirects that, that kind of temper those a little bit, but still result in a net reduction. Um, let's see if this works. Uh, when we look at water consumption trends, um, overall, the the water consumption in town has been uh, it's it's been up and down quite a bit, uh, and so we're looking at a three year average trend. Um, but overall, has been uh, it's uh, uh, trending. Uh, the water usage has been overall trending down slightly, um, and so you can see here the different the tiered rates um, that we are looking at um, when. What, what that looks like when we look at the you know overall uh, rate setting uh, in the in the tiers that Milton uses, um, that increases you know it's we're proposing a three percent increase across the board there to to level fund those, um, and so you can see you know that average bill per quarter is going to go up a little bit less than ten dollars, uh, about you know seven or eight dollars per quarter uh, for the average water bill. So again, a, a relatively modest increase overall. Um, we can do the same thing on the sewer side. And here uh, we do see that uh, sewer expenses are anticipated to rise um, 4%. So, you know, again, somewhat modest, but, but certainly more than that reduction on the water side, unfortunately. Um, largely driven by uh, the increase in the MWRA assessment. Um, you know, you can see when the total utility cost is 9.4 million, the MWRA is 6.8 million. It's the vast majority of that cost, right? Uh, and so when, that, when there's a 6.5% increase in that cost, um, decreases in, in everything else there are just they're they're not going to uh, make up for that and and so again that's the largest driver of that four percent number um, there was a small decrease or there was a decrease in debt service significant by percentage but uh, not not that huge overall uh, when we look at the numbers um, and then there were small increases in directs and indirects as well um, and again all of the both the cost and the revenue numbers on the right hand side mm -hmm. are based on the the town meeting article uh, that was passed a few months ago. Um, again, here we can kind of look at the the sewage uh, trends overall, and you can see, um, you know, there is a, a noted decline in the amount of sewage that the town is is selling. Um, that 
sounds like a good thing, but it also means that we need to spread those costs over fewer gallons. And so it, it means that the rate has to be a little bit higher because the costs are what they are. If you're going to sell fewer gallons. I've never heard the term, we sell sewage before. Well, yeah, yeah it's like a funny. <laughs> I never knew we were in the sewage selling business, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a funny thing. And, uh, but, but right, it is, uh, it's, it's, I guess the way that uh, you're selling the disposal of, of the sewage, right, I, I think it. it's maybe a little it. more. Uh, Just a unique word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, going through, so again, um, with the increase in cost here and then the, the decrease in the amount of gallons, it does cause uh, a little bit larger of an increase on the sewer side. Um, so we're looking at you know 7.8% spread equally across all those different tiers. Um, the increase here then is you know has, has a little more impact on the, the average bill uh, at, at about $35, uh, you can see on the, uh, on the average bill. Um, we do, uh, as part of this kind of report, we set up a lot of different, you know, case scenarios, um, different sort of household types, what, you know, what they might experience here. I think the, the probably the best one to look at to understand is the middle one is the sort of the MWRA's like sort of standard household um, example bill there. Uh, and you can see, you know, when, you, when we combine those two um, rate increases, we will see, you know, an average of about forty dollars a quarter in, in uh, increase. It's six point one percent overall when we blend the three percent on the water side and the seven eight on the on the sewer side. Um, and you know, if you look there across the, the different households, um, obviously are are you know uh, have different usages. For someone you know living alone without a lot of irrigation usage, the you'll see the increases are a lot more modest. Those are the kind of folks on the left side of that table. Um, for you know places that use a lot of water have big yards maybe are institutional um the the increases are not as modest just a quick question uh, don't a lot of those uh, right chase like they they run a separate water service so they don't pay twice yes so, yeah. so we have um residents have the ability to get a second water meter and measure just their irrigation and they, right. they don't pay sewer charges on that it's just a water only bill uh, for all outdoor use that you know we know doesn't go into the sewage system okay. and we've seen that increase and you know likely due to water becoming more expensive just with time um it, it's now somewhat worthwhile to do the plumbing work to get that second meter whereas you know 10 15 years ago to pay a plumber to do all that work to put a second meter in it took a lot longer to recover that that cost um, so th there's been a steady trend of people adding those second meters can you remind everyone, I, I know we, we learned this last year, but in terms of the specific tiers, what's the general, like how, how would somebody know if they don't necessarily know watching this meeting or listening, um, which tier they might fall in? And is there a way for folks to change their tiers based on their usage? Yeah, I, I don't, there's a slide that has the... Um, we have consumption by tier. But, but basically your, your tiers yeah. uh, are based solely on your usage. So the first 600 cubic feet have a set price the next 600 to 3,000 cubic feet, that price goes up and it's, an, it's a steep incline, uh, particularly on the sewer side. So what that does is that shifts the burden of cost to the biggest users. So universities and large properties um, are paying a much more price per gallon premium than a, a smaller user. So, and same for sewer. Yeah, and sewer is even more steep, yeah. Okay, thank you. But Mr. everybody Lopez. pays, you know, everybody's first 600 cubic feet are in that, that first tier, right? It's, it, it's not like you, so you pay the, up to the all of tier one, and then potentially you pay into tier two, or maybe all yeah, of tier you, two. Yeah, right. So if you use six hundred and one cubic feet, you pay one cubic foot in in tier two, not all six hundred and one. It doesn't. There's no like big cliff, you know. That's very helpful. So the key, the key thing, answer to that is, what are the tier levels like? What are you saying? Six hundred cubic feet is the cut off for tier cut off for tier one, and then what's the cut off for tier two? It's they're right here. So three thousand is the cut off for tier two. And Todd, if you go just back to the last slide there that showed the chart. Um, yeah, the, the one with the, the, pie, really the one with the pie. Yes, the one with the no, pie the, <laughs> the very last one. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. if you can see here where it shows somebody in case one who's maybe somebody who lives alone, they're stuck in tier one. And the example that they use, the MWRA example, which is a family of four, their consumption is about three thousand a quarter, which puts them into tier two. Oh, so a smaller yeah. family of four who yeah. can expect to probably stay in tier two for for those billing, and that's what that chart is showing there. Yeah, to give I, you a sense of what that might and I think it's important to note it's it's the same rate regardless. It's just your usage that drives that cost up. 
Exactly. And that's a, it's measured quarterly, the 600 square uh, cubic feet of the quarterly. Build, build quarterly, yeah. Build quarterly, yeah. Yeah. Good? Yes, good. Yeah, and just Go real quick, Mr. Now. Chair, if I could, just, oh, no, oh, just on yeah, top of that. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Milano and, and Amy Dexter. So, you know, after we receive the report from Wood and Carmen, we meet internally. Uh, you know, we consider other factors, like what are the reserves in the enterprise funds? Uh, what do those balances look like? Do we need to be concerned uh, that we have enough reserve for future years and, and that type of thing? So uh, it really is a collective process. It's not just me. So they deserve a lot of the credit. Um, thank you. I think Chase touched on it a little bit with the sewer enterprise funds, just to talk about a little bit like how we use those, what type of reserve we want to have and keep in sure. them. And also, I know years ago we used to have somebody, um, I think it was maybe Kathy Dunphy, who was our MWRA yeah. rep. Do we have somebody that does that now? It's so Chase. It's me. <laughs> okay. yeah, so I'm the Milton MWRA advisory board member. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wasn't a Mike Dennehy before you? Or was um, it has been you since? I think it was vacant. Yeah, I think after okay. Kathy, it might have gone vacant for a little while. Okay. Um, I knew I, when you said I'm like, he's sitting right in front of me. But that gives us a voting yeah. a voting seat um, for the when the programs come up. So we access yeah. their local assistance pipeline programs, which mm -hmm. gives us grant money and right. zero interest zero loans. Interest. And, right. you know, that gives us a say at the table for those. And the other thing that, that we are very lucky to be in the MWRA for is on the treatment side, it's not a headache that we have. We don't have any pump stations. We're no. not drilling wells and pumping water <laughs> out and then having to test for PFAS and then treat for PFAS. Yeah. So uh, we're fortunate to be in the MWRA. It's expensive water, but uh, it's clean and it tastes good. Um, in terms of the reserves, we are in a, a very strong shape on the Water Enterprise Fund so we can afford years where we don't hit our revenue targets. Um, and one thing we're actually been doing with the enterprise fund on the water side is last year we took money out to buy down the rates a bit. This year um, we are paying for $345,000 worth of capital equipment directly out of those reserves. So rather than issuing debt because we have the cash, we're using that. Um, our goal would probably be around 20% of our annual budget that's supported by rates to be in the reserves. As they were mentioning, if we have a couple of years with um, low consumption, we still have high bills. And if we don't have the water or the uh, sewer rate revenue coming in, we could deplete those reserves and then be turned into taxpayers to support these enterprise funds, which are supposed to be funded by the rate payers directly. Sewer is where we have a little bit more of a concern. We have about a half a million in reserve there, uh, which is a low percentage. Um, we have about 2.4 on the water side and has a smaller budget than on the sewer side. So, you know, one of the goals that we have would be hopefully those reserves can build up a little bit more so we have a little bit more flexibility. One thing that we've been asking Chase to do at the end of the year is, is to slow down some of the spending on the sewer side, especially around capital, not capital projects, but investments into the system because we've been worried about where the revenues are gonna come in. So that hurts our flexibility operationally year over year. And um, so it's been an added concern with the sewer side. And if you look, zoom out even more on consumption on sewer, it's just dropping slowly, slowly, slowly with annual blips, but um, unfortunately, as people use less, we still have high bills, we still have to spread that uh, cost around. And with the blended bill, um, I think if we're able to stay low on the water, it means the average bills will go up a, a little bit less than we have. And I think even with these numbers, we're still at a 3% on historical average over the long term in terms of what our annual rate increases are. So we're in, in decent shape, but we have to keep an eye on the sewer enterprise fund in terms of where that is on a reserves basis. And then it sounds like you can't, so there's very separate funds. You could never, yes. you can't put them together to right. deflect some of the Correct. cost no. on the sewer side by taking some from water. Right. Good the idea, other thing, I thought of it might <laughs> like this. Right. If, if, for example, we had a low revenue year, depleted our reserves, mm -hmm. the money would come out of the general fund free cash. Yeah. So they would hit free cash first. Um, and then the other thing that uh, was mentioned in passing, but I just want to reiterate, it's important when we're talking about the rates. While some of the nonprofit institutions don't pay property taxes, they use water, they use sewer, and they, they are paid it's and charged for their usages here. Yeah. yeah. And just okay. a little silver lining on top of that. So these larger projects that are now occurring, so take the Ice House project, for example, they had to pay us a one-time fee of $150,000 just for connecting to our system. Mm -hmm. And we put that money right back into the to, to the rates so um it does subsidize mm -hmm. you know because they're generating new flows that didn't exist that we now have to transport and pay for so we kept that money up front for those projects and, and put it right into the funds 
So this would be Thank similar you. on the Meg Lane, the 40B on Meg Lane? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's driven mm -hmm. by number of bedrooms, number of units. So the larger <coughs> the building, the, the bigger the fee. Anybody else? We're good, you good? Yes. I will mm -hmm. say that everyone, well, Nick, you'll know, I mean, you're a DCI man. Everyone, you know, we turn on our water in this town and you know, it runs, everyone should take a visit to Quabbin and just fall and, and I've had the opportunity on more than one occasion to work, not to work out there and then be to visit it. It is probably one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in the state from a natural system and how it feeds and the, the care and maintenance that goes into maintaining the quality of water that, that we enjoy that comes from there. I and mean, it's absolutely miraculous. It really is. We, we are very fortunate. When, you look at the issues that some of our neighbors have that have independent, you know, reservoir systems and some of the issues that come up with them on it. I mean, Coabin, we are really, really, really very fortunate to be yeah. part of that system. Where would we be without it? Oh, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Anything mm -hmm. else? You good? You good? good. Are we good? Do, um, I'll move to approve the water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2025. Someone, do I have a second? I'll sec okay. second. Okay. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. I, yes. I just, I, yeah, it's good. So, um, so listen, before you leave, I just take a moment to thank you and your staff for everything that they do, hot or cold, snow or wet, just, um, I've always said that, especially from having spent the majority of my life in public safety and not in this seat, not in politics, but um, to see that the work that they do each and every day um, is a credit to the department and to you as the boss. And, since you're here, I just want to take a minute to say that to you tonight and thank you for everything you did this morning. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chan. I'll certainly pass that down. Yep. Thank you. I'm sure they'll all, right. all jump up and down. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, do you want to go to, we, do you want to go back to? I haven't heard from her. So I haven't. All right, so we'll okay. keep going, moving right along. If it's after 10, she's going to have a problem. <laughs> if it's even near 10, we're going to have a problem. Um, okay, so item number 12. I, item number 12 is a discussion, county hospital closure. I, um, I wanted to put this on the agenda because uh, I had the occasion to meet with President <clears throat> Fernandez at uh, B.I. Milton right I think two days after this was announced and came to, to uh, Mr. Milano mm -hmm. with it, some of their concerns. And I know just since I brought it to his, his, his attention that um, he's also gone and met with Coastal this week to kind of, you know, the, the closing of Connie, according to our President Fernandez, is be much different than the closing of Quincy City. Um, you know, for full disclosure, Almost 30 years ago, there were times when you'll notice I'll be in a, in a meeting here and when I speak of something um, particularly emotional, my voice will crack and I will become kind of, <coughs> when I was a young policeman, I, was, I think 29 years of age, I was struck in the head by a prisoner one night and unbeknownst to me and everybody else around me that I was born with a brain aneurysm on the right side <coughs> of my brain. Three days later, while driving a cruiser doing a funeral escort for Thomas Funeral Home on the Southeast Expressway, that aneurysm ruptured and I seized and crashed the cruiser and broke a lot of bones and laid on the side of the Southeast Expressway, not expected to survive. And uh, it was a, I don't, I tell this by memory because I was unconscious, I don't know any of this. So it's, I couldn't get an ambulance to me and a couple of motorcycle cops saw a found ambulance at a coffee shop down underneath and commandant went down and got it and they wound up going the wrong way and they brought me to the county hospital. And my prognosis to survive that night uh, was not very good and uh, it was not expected that I would live a day and uh, I spent many days in intensive care there and I would not be alive today. It took me over a year, I think, to come back to work. Uh, without the skill and expertise of what the county hospital was. And so uh, I've always had an, an affinity for it. But on a, on a more important aspect, one of the things that, and I don't say this, I, 
because the consequences <coughs> of that closing are going to affect our community. It's going to affect um, the staff that work there. It's going to affect the patients. It's going to affect the, the, the police, fire, EMS that bring patients there, the people who walk in there. It's going to affect, you know, so many different things. And one of the major things that is going to impact this community uh, is one very skilled resident who spent his nearly his entire resident of this town who spent nearly his entire life in the mental health field said, "There's no way to make up those 30 inpatient beds. There's a, you know, there's nowhere." Um, and if for anyone who's watching, anyone in this room or knows, if you've visited any any ED anywhere, including BI Milton. You're waiting hours nowadays, and some days these EDs go go black, which means they can they have to defer. So the reason I bring this up is I, I think I'd like to. I've already said this to Nick. At least have Nick reach out to. I know that Mayor Wu has tried to um, already designate that it can't be developed for anything other than a medical facility. Uh, President Fernandez gave me a great idea that uh, perhaps a public private partnership could be developed to create a regional mental health facility. Um, I know Ms. Musto is in the health field and is going to have, it's, now that I brought this up, it's kind of on a way, and this is some of the, uh, some of the others may, but um, this is very important for us as a region, as a community. We are now going to be the host of the only hospital. We've now had two closings on both our sides, Connie to the north and Gwindy City east of us three years ago. And um, I would like for us to try to become part of the solution to this, whether it's with the governor. <laughs> I, I am concerned that the governor, bless you, that the governor did, you know, Boston Medical Center, it looks like came to agreement on St. Yeah. Elizabeth's and Good Sam and kind of got left out, which is one of the most needy neighborhoods um, for this facility, still kind of out in the cold. So um, I wanted to bring it up. Uh, and I welcome any comments. You know, I, I know I'm just putting it out here tonight. I don't think anyone knew what I was going to say, but this is significant for our region. It really is. And I, I don't think there's something we should just talk about. I think we should try to do whatever we can as leaders of this community to try and help create some type of vision or to help come to a solution that serves. Because there are many residents who do go with that. I talked to a woman the other day. She's She's been following there for years. And it's just um, so any thoughts, comments, anyone? We, we? Mr. Zoll, no, like, no, go ahead. You go, go ahead. You go first. Mr. Zoll, yeah. I, I think those are going to be long. So going <laughs> up uh, well, my boss is a, is a is an ER doc too, so I, I have I have a lot of thoughts on this. And I, I was actually speaking with a gentleman who runs uh, eight different uh, emergency departments around uh, Eastern Massachusetts. Uh, we were talking about Kearney. Um, I'm, I'm extraordinarily concerned about this. Um, I'm, I'm concerned. Um, that there were bids in for Kearney that weren't seen as as uh, high enough, uh, and so they weren't accepted. Um, I, I think we're going to be paying the price directly here in Milton. Residents of Mattapan, Dorchester are going to be paying the price. Folks that use the Faulkner uh, and Jamaica Plain are going to be paying the price. Or all of the um, emergency uh, patients, and, and really the emergency departments are the are the safety net of our of our healthcare system. And anybody who's had a kid that's had a problem in the middle of the night or, or, or a parent that's had a problem in the middle of the night, you know how life-threatening it can be if the emergency systems or emergency departments are not prepared to uh, receive you. And, and the closure of Kearney is going to be devastating uh, for a lot of communities, and there, there will be real health implications. So I would be um, very much in favor of figuring out what the town's role could potentially be in promoting any sort of solution to keeping Kearney open, whether it's as a mental health hospital, whether it's mental health with ED, um, something something along those lines, because otherwise it will literally cost lives, well, uh, as you know from your own personal experience, Mr. Wells. Ms. Mustard. Thank you. Um, as somebody who works in the healthcare field as a uh, nurse practitioner, I work in geriatrics. It is uh, terrible, first of all, to, to close a hospital and especially Kearney for the population that it serves in the community. And when we have to send patients out for psychiatric reasons, um, there are very few places that we can send our patients to. And if we have to send them nine times out of 10, they're gonna be sitting in an emergency room with everybody else. And that really is troubling because they need help 
and there won't be the help there. And you know, even before this closure, the hospital systems are having problems where we're getting alerts to try to triage our patients and not send them in if we can help it because the hospitals are overwhelmed. So now to have another closure of a hospital that serves a certain population um, in a community, I think is really devastating. And also for, let's not forget the workers that work there between the, the hospital staff, anybody from housekeeping to dietary, all of the things that make the hospital work, they're all you know, gonna be out of jobs and that affects the community as well. Um, and I think it's just, you know, right now healthcare is really pushed to the, to the brim, you know, and it's really another, piece of a puzzle falling like that is going to be devastating. And again, I think the need for psychiatric beds is huge between, you know, young people and old. And so um, I wonder what will happen, you know, with that type of a closure. Terrible. I, I just wanted to say I, I agree. It, 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 it's yeah. it's I mean, going I, to have a huge impact. And I wonder why... I mean, this is an abstract money. question, but, money. You, but why the other ones could be saved, and this one can't? It's got to be money, but it just, I, I don't did know. You see that? I didn't see, I don't know what the two bids were. So I, I, I don't know exactly yeah. what they I, don't, I know either. that they received bids yeah. on them that weren't up to the level. To what they wanted. Yeah. And, and the, the other thing is, what are they doing, you know, are they triaging the staff needs of what, where are these people going to go? Like, and even yeah. for BID, I don't want to put words in this, but like, they're going to have to up this, like, Someone should be proactive here. I, I want to look at this in a multifaceted way from a region because this is going to affect, you know, it's, and, and Ms. Musto's right. Um, when you're, the difficulty here is a, a county, you could go to county to be, you know, cleared and prove you could wind up going upstairs with an old bed. Here, you're going to have to bring in another agency like social to, to, to come in, clear them. Find a bed, and that can take days. You you, you can do you can do twenty four forty eight hours sitting on a stretcher in ED. And so, like I I just know you you and I have had actually Mr. Denny and I well, my time as chief, and I'm sure Chief King. I mean BID went a long way to try to address this in the past few years. Is you know we've had to have officers stay there for like hours at a time to watch a patient because there's no no bed for them to be, and it's that there's a safety aspect having them in a general area of, a, of an emergency department. So um, I don't want to put this on you, and I'm more than willing, I'd like to try and bring some of these. I, I talked about perhaps, I did ask President Fernandez if he'd think about this, come in. There is one resident I don't want to announce him tonight because I don't want to say it, who was you know, very involved, was, was in the Patrick administration, very involved in this, who really kind of gave me an hour's worth. But I think, I know perhaps on a state level, they may look at us now as being anti any, but I would like to try to be part of the solution versus um, this is something that we can't sit back and two years from now and say, oh my God, what did we do? Like, there's something we need to do now. So that's why I wanted to bring it up so we can at least, and, and obviously to, to, to all of you, you already kind of realize it. You already mm -hmm. realize that the effects of it. So um, I'll leave with that for now. So um, thank you. So item number 13, discussion update. Oh, move. I, I think Joanna. Oh, she's on? Yep. Hey. So we can go to item eight. Putting, uh, my, putting the car in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to back up to item number eight, which is um, discussion approval, bond sale awards, and we welcome to our meeting our town treasurer, Ms. McCarthy. I don't see You see it? She's uh, joining now. Okay. Good evening. Well, who do you want to open this? You want to have, how do you want to do She can. She can run it. All yours. Mr. Marlowe is throwing you right under the bus here. Uh, I, I apologize. I didn't know he was going to do that to you. So um, you can be as brief as you want. Good evening. <laughs> well, I'm. thank you, Nick. Um, <laughs> thank you for deferring me to a little bit later in the agenda here. I appreciate your flexibility. Um, so this is, this is really just to kind of take a vote to issue um, some debt, some Series A and some Series B debt. Um, I, I believe that the vote language is in front of you, um, and it's extensive. And I appreciate the the members having come in and um, and signed uh, documents in advance. Um, so I can give you a little bit of a, the the backdrop of of these bonds in particular. But the Series A bonds were for fire station design and construction. 
we have a um, a bond anticipation note outstanding that um, comes due a couple days after this issuance is set to close later this week. So most of the money that we will um, receive um, from this issuance will go to pay that short-term note outstanding. Um, so like I said, the the amount for the Series A bonds, the, the $20 million, $930 um, in, in principle is uh, in large part to, to um, finance the fire station construction um, at about $18.5 million. Um, the fire station design holds the, the remaining $2.4 million uh, on those Series A notes. Um, so we went out to bid. Uh, we got 10 bids. Um, and I think you all know, I think um, um, Mr. Milano had given you an update on our um, S&P ratings call that we recently had. So that was a factor in, in obviously, um, the bids that were provided. Um, which was great. And so I, I think that we got like a, a reasonable um, true interest cost at 3.67% uh, on this. Um, that that generated 10 bids to the town and we, we took the, the best offer. Um, any questions on that in particular? Nope. Do anyone okay. comments, questions? Your motion? Are we ready for a motion? No, hold she on. Should go well, so, so, so then no, Series B, no, let, let me just... Let me just um, um, highlight the Series B bonds. Yeah. So that that is an issuance of two point seven three five in in principle, um, a smaller issuance. Um, those are to finance various projects that were authorized and approved at town meetings. I think most of the the approvals happened in the May twenty twenty three town meeting. Um, I would you know just looking at the list of of purposes. I think the, the largest is the salt shed at 376,000. Oh wait, uh, animal shelter at 650,000. Um, there's a couple roadways at 704,000 um, and then various other, uh, you know, town projects and, and, um, and purposes. So, so the series B issuance of 2.735 came in with four bids uh, a true interest cost there of 2.91%. So that also was a pretty good rate. Um, and we, yeah, that, that was to, uh, again, to Raymond James and Associates as the agenda states. So we're looking to issue these um, with the date of August 29th. And like I said, the large um, portion of the proceeds will be used to pay off the bond anticipation notes that come due on August 30th. Good. Thank you. So, at least for the purpose of discussion, I'll make a motion to approve twenty million nine hundred thirty thousand general obligation fire station bonds, Series A, dated August 29th, twenty ninth, twenty twenty four, to Huntington Securities Inc. and approve two million seven hundred thirty five thousand dollars general obligation municipal purpose loan of twenty twenty four bonds series B dated August 29, twenty twenty four to Raymond James and Associates Incorporated and to waive the reading of the entire formal vote. Thank God. <laughs> but I'll thank God leave the that. thank God part out of it. Um, <laughs> second I'll second, second yeah. Questions, comments? All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Thank you. It's unanimous. Um, I believe we're going to run the trip. You can go back to your dutiful, whatever it is you're doing. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate Thank it, guys. Have a great night. Take care, everyone. Take care. Okay. So now we're going to go back to... 13. Yeah, 13. Okay. So ha, discussion, update, homo petition for senior means tested property tax exemption. Mr. Milano or Mr. O'Connell? Mr. Connors. Mr. Connors, I'm, I'm going to step out for once. I already know about this song. Okay, next up, pull up the presentation. We will be relatively brief. Uh, happy to answer questions, but. 30 um, minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, we need to go to the second slide. So, as we have talked about the potential for an operational override, there's discussion around that exclusion from the building. One of the things that uh, Nick had asked us to look at at Town Hall was ways to uh, both look at the revenue side, but also, um, you know, exemptions and tax relief side as well for folks that are in town. 
uh, one of the things that we came up with as we looked at communities um, that are our peers and that we you know, talk to on a regular basis is the idea of a means tested um, form of property tax relief for seniors that allows folks to age in place uh, and to support that effort. Um, the goals are really easy here. You know, that was, that's the broad idea that Nick gave us. This, these are the goals that we had as we looked at this. We want it to be easy to understand for the folks that would be applying, which in this case would be seniors, easy to administer for our staff, particularly in the assessor's office, easy to apply for, um, and then easy for the town to provide. And it's really this idea that we didn't want to be reinventing the wheel, but we wanted to look for opportunities to provide relief um, in ways that are meaningful uh, and use frameworks that are already in place. So just very briefly, the idea of what is means tested, it's a criteria to measure, in this case, the sum of the person's assets to determine who would qualify for this tax exemption. Um, if we can just go to the next slide, I think that's the one. We, the, the, the Commonwealth already provides within the tax code for the senior circuit breaker. There's a lot of words here, but in short, if you're a homeowner and more than 10% of your Massachusetts income is spent um, on your property taxes, or if you're a renter and more than 25% is spent on property taxes, there is a benefit that is available to you. Uh, it's a dollar for dollar match uh, for every dollar uh, beyond that 10% or 25% threshold that the state provides as a credit uh, up to a maximum. That maximum is something that can be adjusted year to year. Uh, the current maximum is uh, 2,590. Um, so again, I'll be happy to answer questions as we go, but I don't wanna read through this whole slide for folks. I want to make sure you're still awake when I get to the end. If we're taking questions as we go, just on the last slide. Feel free. So you open I'll try to answer it. Yeah. Um, the assessed value, um, the very last, is that something that scales on an also annual adjusted. basis? Also okay. adjusted. So the, both the benefit and that can be adjusted, as well as the income levels. Thank you. Adjusted by the Commonwealth, not by the community. Um, so what we're proposing tonight is you know, sort of the beginning of this discussion. Um, is the idea that the town meeting would approve a home rule petition that establishes this local exemption. Uh, in this case, and this is something that's done differently in every community, we want to make sure that the match percentage is set by the board uh, annually. Um, and we also would want to provide for the opportunity for town meeting to provide authorization for this uh, at regular interval intervals that could be decided. Both these cases allow us to look at this on a set basis, whether it's an annual, every three years, every five years, some, it gives some opportunity for the community to make sure uh, that this is working. Uh, the idea is that we would use the circuit breaker eligibility that the state income tax already provides uh, as the requirement for Milton. There's an annual application process where folks would come in with their tax, uh, their taxes that they submitted to the assessor's office for uh, affirmation of their el eligibility. And then one of the questions that obviously comes up is what does it cost? And that's what this last piece is uh, meant to address uh, or begin to address is all taxpayers are sharing, sharing the burden um, that is put on seniors by shifting taxes. It is not going to lower the overall right. revenue to the town. So if we can keep moving. Um, so, you know, the proposal would provide a match up to 100 percent that would be set by Milton. Um, the eligibility criteria would match the state program. So when it comes to income, assessed value and that sort of thing, but we would add the idea that residency in Milton is a requirement. Uh, the 10 years is not at the address that they are seeking this relief at. It's just sort of a commitment that they've shown to the community over time. And now that we're showing to help uh, try to allow them to age in place. No other, no other significant assets. And then trust documents need to be reviewed um, again by the assessor's office to make sure that uh, the owner is um, the person that is, you know, the beneficiary and go on. How do you determine that if an asset is significant? We would have to set that in this process before okay. we adopt anything. Thank you. Yeah. As a, you mean as a, as a price? What? Yeah, it, w whether, you know, it would be, you know, the, the types of things that they talk about are trusts, second homes, things that would normally, you know, sort of identify that you should not be availing this opportunity of yourself. But I can... I have examples that I didn't bring tonight, but that I can share if we were, would move forward. Thank you. Of what other communities have decided to use. And we could also always set our own in that case as well. So to item one, uh, bullet one, <clears throat> 10 year residency, it's not 10 year ownership, it's 10 year residency. So like if a person lived, was a renter for like four or five years and then they now owned for five, six, you know, 
Yeah. Sometimes it takes a long time to own a home to clean. All right. So or alternatively, if you downsize to okay, a smaller home okay. as, as you're a senior, but you you're still on that cusp on the, on the income it. side. Okay. But it's a demonstration that you've been a taxpayer in town. You've contributed to the community over time. Okay. <clears throat> uh, one of the questions that's come up is, you know, we talked to Nick about this and others are, what are some other communities that have done this? This is, as you can see, sort of spread geographically. Um, it's a representative list. It's not an exhaustive list. We can get together the, the final total number. But these are communities that have already adopted it, have had it in place, or are in the process of doing so. So the impacts, um, and this is where I will also get to cost, which I know is a, uh, an issue. Um, it allows seniors who have contributed to the community over time to age in place. It doesn't lower the revenue, as I mentioned, overall. Uh, it is something where we're, we would look at what the shift would be when the tax rate is set. These are the most recent numbers that uh, Division of Local Services had, which is for the 2022 tax year. There were 415 filers. The total, total claimed in town was 468,000 for the average credit there, obviously. When I have that anticipated usage for 140 to 200 filers, that's after talking to a couple of assessors who have done this. The, the number one sort of off the top number is a renter is not eligible for this because it's property tax relief. Um, so there are renters in right. town who do qualify for the senior circuit breaker, as I mentioned in that initial eligibility slide, but they would not be eligible here because this is solely meant to be uh, trying to keep property taxes more affordable for folks that are in town. There's then folks that are sort of on the income limit uh, that by getting this credit or by doing something for work, they might go back and forth and be they sort of dip in and out of the program year to year. Um, they're not in it on a consistent annual basis, but it's every, every other year, every two years. Uh, and then there's the folks that have to come in and prove the el eligibility uh, with whatever standards we set, Mr. Zoll. So that, again, it, it starts to lower that number from 415 uh, a, little, a little bit to what the, the anticipated impact would be. If we could go to the next slide, I think I have the numbers there. So in looking um, at one that I, I spoke to was Hingham, they recently introduced this. Um, they have had approximately 100 over the first two years. Uh, and so that this is the number that I looked at here. Um, the maximum credit to the, that the state allows right now is 2590. That's for this year, it was reset for tax year 2025, or 2024, sorry. Um, and so that's, an, we use sort of the maximum credit even though mm -hmm. when you see our averages, we're not maxing out every, every individual here. Uh, so the potential impact would be 259,000, which when we spread across all of the residential um, units that are part of the, the property tax roll, it comes out, it's a little less than 30, and it does not include when we actually would break it between the, the impact on both commercial, industrial, and residential. So it sort of stayed on the higher side um, with, again, that and the average assessed value of the home in town being a million dollars, which is also at the LS number. It's not just something we pulled out of thin air. It's a $30 annual bill, not a $30 quarterly bill? Correct. Yes. I, I know that this is your last slide. Yes. Um, so can I, <laughs> following along secretly here, um, on the, um, the uh, other communities that have done this program, yeah. on, are they usually, um, for the towns at least, are they usually do, having this done by the select board or uh, done by town meetings? And do they have a usual, is there like a standard, like most towns are select board every three when years? When we're setting or, the number? Yeah, in terms yeah. of setting the number. So, it, generally, it's the select board that either sets a number at the beginning and they stick with it, or as they've moved, as the sort of program has evolved and progressed over time, they've allowed the select board to set it on an annual basis okay. instead of, you know, sort of setting it at 100% or more than 100% match uh, and just sort of rolling with it as the state will slowly be, you know, raising <laughs> what the, the max is right. to index. Okay, thank you. So that would be something that we could decide, obviously, before the our mold petition will go before town meeting. So to That's, Mr. Zoll's point, though, this will require us to create an article for town meeting, correct? Correct. The home do we want to do this at the annual? I, I think what we've talked about is whenever the next available okay, town meeting right. is, we'd want to have this in shape because we want to get it filed as soon as possible at the legislature because okay. that process it. alone could take a while. <clears throat> I get it. So to get it rolled out sooner rather than later for um, folks in Milton, it would, it's going to take a long, it's going to be a long runway. So the sooner we do it, the better it would be. Okay. This is a great idea, by the way. Thanks for all your work. Sure. Together. I think there's a lot still to learn and work yes. out, obviously. Yeah. yeah. 
we knew it when he was in the agenda meeting. I, I, when <laughs> I got them, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, so I, any other questions? You're good? We good? Okay, well, there's no motion. Just a quick question on Westford. Why are they a three year pilot? They want to see how it works? That was the way that they had passed the home rule. Oh, to see how it was. Okay. Yeah. You have a question? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, and can you just go over again the money in terms of how much? So is it a thousand per household? Right now, the maximum is twenty five ninety for this. And what we, for the what tax are we year. looking at basing it? So when you're doing these number Can calculations, what is the dollar amount you're That's looking at? That's based on a hundred hundred residents being eligible and getting the full credit. Yeah. Okay. Out of the four fifteen, that four fifteen would not be the number that would come in. Right. Because renters are included there, and then there's folks that will dip in and out on the eligibility side with their okay. their income. Okay. So this would be a hundred households. That, in this math, that's a hundred households. Right. Yes, that's what I. That's I. Mm -hmm. I want to. I, I want to distinguish between this is a hundred. <coughs> and then, Roxanne, is significant. But you already, this, yeah. this is also a. It's a hundred percent match. So if the board yeah. decided we wanted to move forward with fifty or mm -hmm. seventy-five, it raises and lowers yeah. the number of folks that could be included yeah. under that same you know two hundred fifty-nine yeah. thousand or lowers the overall impact. I mean, I think it's an interesting program. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the numbers and, and what that would mean. But I think it's you know a great way to keep people and in town. You know. Yeah, and it's you're you're anticipating it would be 140 to 200 people. That's based on the conversations I've had with assessors and other mm -hmm. communities. But yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other, I've talked to Charlie about this. We've also you know spent a little bit of time, and we'll continue to look at other exemptions that the town hasn't acted on or accepted, um, just to make sure that when mm -hmm. we do come forward with this, we're we're trying to come with as many opportunities as possible for property tax exemptions for folks that are eligible that make sense for the community. So is all. Thank, thank you, Ms. Ross. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming, well, maybe I shouldn't assume anything. If some, if so we have a lot of seniors who are in uh, affordable housing, it, it, are, is, are they automatically excluded because, or are they included because of their average median income? Do you know what that? I would, I want to research it to be sure. I don't want to answer you. Okay. Give you the wrong That's, answer. I just think something that worth looking into, right. but because um, there is, you know, subsidies mm -hmm. there. But are you meaning like affordable as far as own affordable or affordable like renting affordable? Uh, no, it's owned because okay. it's just for owners ownership. Okay. But you know, I, I'm just thinking in terms of like the income versus the um, versus the tax payments. Like I'm I know there are there, there are impacts at the state level for housing subsidies, but I want to make sure I give you the right information. Yeah, that's just something I'm just be curious to know what the sure. impact would be. Thanks. Okay, so we don't need a more. This this was more like informative. Was yeah, just to make sure we had support from the board to keep um, spelling this out. So the next time we bring it to you, we'll try to hit on develop the specifics start it out at a you know at a hundred percent match um think about the other significant assets um and and have a draft for everybody to look at and and uh, provide us feedback on from there one, one more question if i can ask you. just from a like a timing perspective if we do have a fall town meeting um wh what when do you think this would basically kick in for seniors to see a reduction in their tax bill the new session in of the legislature wouldn't start until the beginning of the new year. It really depends on how quickly they would move more than anything else. So possibly not until um, calendar year 26. I mean, I spoke basically. to the assessor that's in Wakefield and Reading. Right. And one passed in six weeks. The other one took 18 months. Okay. <laughs> so it literally is, Yeah. it could be two fiscal years or okay. it could be, um, you know. I don't want to say anything, but I get it. <laughs> so it really, it, it depends on the legislature. So to, to next point, as long as we get it in front of town meeting, we've you know, prepared you all in advance. We'll do our it. job as quick as we can. Right. Help yeah, everybody. exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. That's it. Get all that, Elaine? <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, moving on. So item number 14, discussion approval, council and aging air source heat pump project. Mr. Milano, you can. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Yours. Chair. Um, we have a HVAC retrofit project proposal in your packet with a little blurry <clears throat> background. Um, this building has the original heating and cooling system um, approaching end of life. Uh, the facilities department is looking at ways to um, replace that and had a meeting with uh, one of the firms that we use to do our energy efficiency projects. And they suggested um, an air source heat pump replacement project. Um, 
which whereby we would um, decommission our gas furnace uh, that heats this building um, and transition over to an air source heat pump system that would provide heating and cooling uh, with electricity. Um, there are major incentives for projects like these available. Um, so we would use incentives through um, the utilities to um, combine with a town appropriation uh, to finance the project. So the overall project um, recommended by facilities is to replace these as proposed by Guardian. And that cost right now is $388,000. We have an appropriation for improvements to this building of $160,000 that was approved as part of the fiscal 25 capital budget. That obviously isn't enough. Um, the utility incentive right now is estimated at $120,000 if we were to move forward with this project. The balance of about $108,000 uh, we could pay back on our bill over five years, uh, uh, no 0%. 0%. So the utility would finance it upfront. We would pay higher than usual utility bills for five years to pay that uh, balance back over, over that time period. Um, so before we went down that road any further, I just wanted to make sure the board would be open to and okay with us doing that and knowing that we would have to budget that accordingly for the next five years. But at the same time, taking advantage of $120,000 in incentives to replace this project. So it would be a um, major capital project that we're only kicking in about half of the cost at the end of the day. So I'm only going to go as far as to the members who have been here in the winter to refresh <laughs> their memories and what it's like here in some of the December, February and January nights when we're here. So um, at least to me, from particularly from the capital perspective, Anything that's flexible that uses, you know, normal line item operations or our bonding is something that interests me. But Mr. Gohane, this is your business. I'm the, the, the only concern I have is that typically in residential heat pumps, the cost to operate the utility bill is twice what it was for gas. And that's often sometimes hidden in this. People are surprised by the fact they hear this super efficient, super, it is super efficient compared to resistance heat, right. which this has for backup. I, I just, sometimes the, the, in residential it's twice. It costs twice to heat with a heat pump than it does with gas. So just be aware. <clears throat> I know I'm coming in the last hour. No, I'm just no. seeing this for the first time. No. But that's typically what happens. It, it, I, I don't. I, I see this kilowatt hours saved, therm saved, annual savings. I, I don't know if we have time to look at that, but I, it's it's all I know is in residential, people are surprised. They go, the heat pump, it's so efficient, and my electric bill is twice what it used to be. That's the surprises I hear out there. So just throwing it out there. First time you're hearing that, huh? No, that's, no. We've heard th we've heard those concerns. I think um, we trust their analysis. Um, it's also hard in 24 calendar year 2024 mm -hmm. to spend major money on a, a upgrading gas right. lines because we might be faced with um, looking to phase those out. Um, so I think it's if for that purpose, it's probably worthwhile looking at. I, if you want it further now, I'm happy to provide something on the cost and on the and, and on the energy use forecast. Uh, just so we know. I mean, sure. I, I, I'm with the whole the electric, we got to go there and the rest of it. But just so that we understand truthfully what the costs yeah. are, that's all I'm saying. Just you know, for, yeah. just to your, you you know, know. all of a sudden you have a department head coming in a year later doing our annual budget and for electric <laughs> costs, you know, trip, you know, for some <laughs> on, on a small as you know, on a small department like this, sure. all of a sudden, that's a tough one to go ahead. Go ahead and the, oh, no, if you and, have and the one, one last thing, too, is that the sizing is critical because if you know, they lose efficiency as it gets colder. So you have to balance between oversizing them a little bit so that at that lower cold, they have enough efficiency and that your resistance to electric heat's not kicking in at 30 degrees because right. then it really will kill you in the cost. So mm -hmm. it just... This is all I'm just so I know that the town has negotiated around like clean energy mm. uh, and we have like municipal energy rates. So I'm, I'm curious to know if that play, plays in here at all 
And then also, I would be curious, I, 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 Mr. Klein is 100% right in terms of the electric bills going. A lot of people that put in heat pumps also put in solar panels. And so it kind of offsets the electricity cost because they're getting, re, you know, they're, and, and I know with my, my house, I don't have heat pump, but I have like a, a, an electric car and I can, you know, watch if I'm charging my car in the winter, like my electricity bill versus like if the sun's out and I'm plugging my car and it's not really affecting anything. So I'm curious uh, in terms of the municipal electric rates and then also in terms of um, if, if there is a way or if there would be any incentives to put in solar, which would be, again, maybe a higher upfront investment cost, but save money in the long term in terms of the, uh, the uh, energy expenditure. I don't do think there's solar on this one. This is not, not, not here. Town Hall does. The schools do. Um, the roof will need to be replaced before we could move oh to that. Um, I don't know if we've had our vendors and assess this building for that. We can certainly do that and follow mm -hmm. up, but the, a, a roof building envelope and mechanical systems were what we we're looking at to address um, with this building. Um, so that's why we hadn't looked at that that's necessarily. Maybe right somebody's away. problem in the future, though, yeah. or, or right. opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to, it brings up a good point. So perhaps, I mean, not especially for Tom, for consolidated is that looking forward when the this roof comes up do you, when you do the capital project, do you add solar at that point? And I, I don't even know, I can't remember, I, mean, I know Mr. Mm -hmm. Clark prior to Tim did evaluations on it, which is how the yeah. solar wound up on the town hall and some of the school buildings. Um, I mean, it'd actually be better if you if you did the heat pump first and then later you're looking at the roof, then you would really right. know what your electricity costs right. are. Right, and you know what you need you for solar. Against for yeah. solar. Yeah. So I'm okay with Rob, but I just think that, I, I think to, because I, I'm just thinking of the COA direct that, you know, two years from now coming, well, <coughs> you just articulated yeah. my, it's great, it's warm in here now, but the, you know, the electricity bill sort of was so, okay. but solar is something long-term you could look at here, but, but, but I, I'm not, it's not, I don't want to get out of my skis, not my expertise, I just know that you're right when you want to look at it when you do a roof replacement. So, um, you want a motion on this? Do you need a motion to approve this? No, as long as there's general comfort with it, we'll we'll nail down a couple of those questions and uh, circle back. General okay. comfort. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Did you say what? Did you do, was that I said general comfort. General comfort. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. okay, item 15, discussion approval is the extension of the agreement between DCR and Cade 176 Corporation for the UN rank permit for a period of three years. A motion? I'll make that motion. So you're going to move to approve the extension yeah, of the Yeah, DCR okay. and Kane 176 Corp for the Ulan Ring permit for a period of three years. I have a second. I'll second. Second by Mr. Zoll. All those in favor? Yes. Uh, Aye. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, item 16, discussion approval. This is reappointments to the Conservation Commission. Can I have a motion to reappoint Ingrid Beatty, Arthur Doyle, and Winnie Garpow? to the Conservation Commission. I'll move to reappoint the following individuals of the Conservation Commission for a three-year term, Ingrid Beatty, Arthur Doyle, Wendy Garpo. I'll second. Second by Ms. Musto. All those in favor? Yeah. Aye. 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 <clears throat> okay, discussion approval, item 17, one day local license application. Milton Arts Center located at 334. Uh, are these all theirs? Are these all? Um, yeah. Yep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, all of them. I'm gonna do them all. 334 Edgecum Road. First Friday, October 4th, 2024, 6 to 10. First Friday, November 1st, 6 to 10. Comedy event, November 30th, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. First Friday, December 6th, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. It's gonna be New Year's Day before we know it, do I have a second? <laughs> I'll second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. It's, a, it's uh, <clears throat> approved, okay, item. <laughs> item 18. So this is a motion to approve the Suffolk Resolves Day Proclamation. The Suffolk Resolves, do, do I have a copy of that? Do I, is that in my, uh, I don't think I have a copy of it. I was gonna read it, but I don't think I have a copy of it. Is it there? We just got it updated, didn't we? I can read it, yeah. or I can display okay, it. Go ahead, yeah, read it. go ahead and bring it, you can read it. If you want. Are you gonna display it up on the screen? Yep. Okay. Oh, it's here, in the back. It's your neighbor. Yeah. Fence. <laughs> You want me to do it? It is my neighbor. Yeah, yeah. you want to do it? You do it. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, know, sure. here, hold on, I can get there. Good night, Elaine. Good night. Um, okay, proclamation. Whereas the Suffolk Resolves was a declaration made on September 9th, 1774 by the leaders of the Suffolk County, Mass there's a misspelling in the county there, um, right. yeah. Massachusetts to reject the Massachusetts <laughs> Government Act 
and called for, sorry, called for a boycott of imported goods from Britain unless the intolerable acts were repealed and whereas the resolves played an integral role in shaping colonial an animosity and ultimately contributed to the United States Declaration of Independence in 1776. Is animosity the right word? I don't know. I didn't okay. Write and, okay, and whereas Dr. <laughs> Joseph Warren introduced the first draft of the Suffolk Resolves at the Suffolk County Convention <laughs> Committees on Correspondence, in Glen County, uh, sorry, <laughs> on Correspondence on September 6, 1774, Three days later, the declaration was approved at the Daniel Vose House in Milton, Massachusetts. Following the issue, issuance of the resolves, Paul Revere delivered it to the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where it was endorsed on September 17, 1774, as a show of colonial solidarity. And whereas the Daniel Vose House was moved from Lower Mills to 1370 Canton Ave in 1950 in order to prevent its demolition, it is now known as the Suffolk Resolves House and was restored to its original colonial appearance and became the headquarters for the Milton Historical Society. The Suffolk Resolves House was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the, select board, the Milton Select Board, in recognition of the 250th anniversary of its passage, do hereby declare September 9th, 2024, as Suffolk Resolves Day in Milton, Massachusetts, given this day, Tuesday, August 27, 24. Signed on behalf of the chair of the Select Board. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I believe, did the Historic Commission, they drafted it, right? Did they, oh, did we draft it? They, I believe they- oh, I think they, it was a team okay. effort. It was a team Is effort. Is animosity the right word though? Is it, would unity be better in shaping colonial unity? Are we shaping animosity? I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't alive then, I don't know. <laughs> All right, I'm fine with it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did we vote? We just voted yes. We okay, All those <clears throat> okay. Now, uh, item 19, Milton Community Constance Proclamation. So this is from Timothy Steele. You have that one too as well? I do, yeah. So this I is that. how many years? I don't know, I'm trying to think. 10? I think my wife did too. Two of them when she was in. Um, oh, here we go. So this is, I'll do this one. So this is, uh, whereas the Milton Community Concerts is celebrating the 10th anniversary season at the historic meeting house at First Parish Unitarian Universalist. And whereas over the past nine years, Milton Community Concerts has enriched the cultural landscape of our community with great musical performances through the visionary leadership of Timothy Steele, Milton Community Concerts has produced 33 concerts featuring 344 artists, including Metropolitan Opera performers, TED speakers, and Broadway stars. And whereas, as a grant recipient, Milton Community Concerts understands the importance of giving back. It has raised $25,669 to support both local and national charitable causes. The Milton Community Concerts also collaborates with local artists, local art organizations to promote diversity. And now, therefore, <clears throat> be it re resolved that we, the Milton Select Board, congratulate Milton Community Concerts on its 10th anniversary season. And prosperity extends appreciation to the dedicated individuals who make the concert series such a great success. Given this day, Tuesday, August 27th, 2024, <coughs> signed by the chair on behalf of the Select Board, Richard G. Wells, chair. Second. I will second. All those in favor? Yes. 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 I, I just want to, having in, um, been to several of these, and uh, in an ironic, uh, not that I tell personal stories, although I already told a big one tonight that I never even talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife, for many years, attended the Lawn G School of Music and was under the direction and student of a famous baritone by the name of Robert Honeysucker. Robert Honeysucker was born in the South. and son of a minister and he traveled the world uh, performing before symphonies including Boston, New York, everywhere and um, the last it was the last time that they sang together he died tragically having a heart attack in a car accident. Mm -hmm. I think that six weeks later driving to sing the New York Symphony on 95 and uh, mm -hmm. the last concert that they did together was here at First Parish with two of them. Wow. So, mm -hmm. And it was a, I have some great video, it was a great night because he, I just think of, I remember the first day when at Longy you auditioned and I signed her up for music lessons, which she wanted nothing to do. And then you go for an audition and he selected her. And I remember going to, at the end of each semester, they have a, a recital and the, the students, your test is, you have two songs, you have to get up and sing them. And I remember going to the first recital and I looked at her and I said, oh boy, she's in over, overhead. <laughs> and now some 
probably just in the probably 500 national anthems later and not to even mention other things that she's done in this war. Like she's <laughs> been across the globe and then some just, um, I give them immense gratitude to them. Um, but I'm, but I'm the notice was that Robin and Tim Steele were friends. Oh, and that's yeah. how he saw that Pauline was one of his students and that's how they wound up coming here. Nice. Small world. Wow. So congratulations. Music, as you know, Mr. Zola talked about, music is a, is a uh, very important thing in, in, in human life, but it's a really a critical thing. And you know, there's so many aspects of it in this town that exist, and this is just one more of them. So this is a good one. Okay, moving right along, we're almost there. Uh, item 20, item 20, discussion pool and meeting minutes for July 23rd, 2024, and August 14th, 2024. There was, some, was there an edit there? Did I? There, there were just basic little um, typo kind of. So I'm going to make, make a motion to approve those meeting minutes subject to final edit. That okay. I've, I'm, I'm going to ask Lynn, are they? They're all done. done. Okay. Yeah. So I don't even need, yeah. to, I don't yeah, even need to do it. Okay. So. Uh, that's the motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, next I'm one. Just, I'm, oh, so. I'm going to abstain just because I haven't read the, I okay, know they came, right, okay. they, they, okay. the, the 23rd ones came through, I think, like an hour ago, or an hour before our meeting, so I didn't have a chance to read them. Okay. So I'm just okay. And then there's a, the next motion is a move to approve the meeting when it's dated August 14, 2024. I'll second. Second. All those in favor on that one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Town Administrator's Report, Mr. Milano. Uh, just... Um, just wanted to mention that the group working on Wharf Park, uh, which is where the farmer's market is, is having a, another public meeting or their final public meeting to share the final design on Wednesday, September 4th at 7 p.m. here in the Council on Aging. Um, that has been started to be advertised, so we'll make sure to get that out there. Um, and that's it from me this evening. Um, I'll have more on the 10th of September. Quick question. I got an email from Scott. Do we need to bring them in? Oh, is that the WAF committee? Is that uh, September 10th is what we're targeting for that for them to come to the select board for a vote? Yes. Okay. Very good, Scott. If you're watching, I didn't miss it, and I, 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 I'm a little busy this week. But I got. I do. I know, he, he knows where I am. That I, I know how hard they've worked on this. Um, the last meeting we had with the yeah. planning board was I thought was very good and. Um, I don't think people realize how how much work and how much effort has gone into trying to transform that entire piece of property, <laughs> not just to transform it, to buy it for some of it first. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who's committed to that, and I, including his committee as well. So, uh, okay, I have nothing. I'm going to pass future item. Could I? Could oh, I I'm just sorry, add, absolutely. May I add something to the sure. chair's report? Sure. Um, so I just a couple of quick things. One is um, just we haven't met since we. Had that there, were, there was the event with the ice bucket challenge over. Oh, it's been a while. So at the Forbes Museum. So it was really a very nice time. And um, a lot of teams were there. It was pretty cool to see everybody that came out in the community. So that was a great event. Um, and then also a few days ago, there was the National Night Out at the police station. And wanted to thank them for another really great event. Um, and then on a third note, I did want to uh, talk about... Um, an issue for the Board of Health. Uh, you, if you've been following along, I, I did want to add something in about this. So um, you've probably seen in the news things about the Triple E and the West Nile virus. It's been on, all over the news lately. So a couple of things, um, and I have another update on it, so I, I'll let you know about that. When I first put my thoughts together for today, it was um, that we're in, we live in Norfolk County and that we're at moderate risk for West Nile and low for Triple E. But that has changed, so I'll redo that what I'm going to read you in a minute. Um, August and September are the months when most people are um, exposed to West Nile virus. And so some of the suggestions are to wear long sleeves, um, dusk to dawn, uh, mosquito netting on baby carriages, mosquito repellent you should have on. Uh, any standing water that you have in your yard, you should try to empty that um, because those are breeding grounds. But we did just get an alert today, um, it just came in like right around five o'clock, that um, the Mass Department of Public Health has confirmed the third and fourth West Nile virus human cases of the season. Um, and uh, one was in Norfolk County, one was in Suffolk. And due to these detections, Milton has become uh, increased to high risk for West Nile virus. So that just came through. Um, so just wanna make sure that 
you know, perhaps on our website and when we send some things out on the sure. town feed that we put something out there about how people can um, protect themselves as well and let them know that the risk has been raised. Okay, we'll do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I just put a plug in? Mr. Absolutely. The, uh, mm -hmm. the, the first first Friday of the season is Friday, September 6th, 4 p.m. at the uh, uh, Manning Community Park at the East Milton Deck. Community uh, Chamber of Commerce and Milton Arts Center are getting together. They've got a bunch of musicians. There's going to be food, artists, um, uh, artisans. Great, great time. Starts at four, ends at dusk. Wear your bug, bug spray. <laughs> And um, it should should be a lot of fun. It's it's family friendly uh, and it's completely free. And one more. So like, that was the only one I was going to do. So you got. <laughs> oh, I'm and sorry. No, I know about it. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and the Milton Public Library has an event on the Thursday, uh, right before that event on the Friday. So the Thursday before, which is right after Labor Day, I think it's five thirty to seven thirty, and they're gonna it's they're gonna have some events there at the library as well. Five thirty to seven thirty. I think we covered you. everything. You've done my work for me. So I was not prepared for it. <laughs> I guess I should say, don't forget Tuesday is election day. Yeah, that's yeah. important. <laughs> and you can early vote. You can early vote this week. Yep. 8 to 5 30, 8 to 5, 8 to 8. Business hours. Business and then, hours. Um, you can still return your uh, mail in ballot as well up until um, 8 o'clock on election day, really. So, given that, item 26, oh, future agenda items, anything of importance that we need to? I think we've talked about a lot of future stuff tonight. Okay, so I'll jump to 26. Is, is there anything we want to say into here? I don't know. Oh, public comment response? I don't know. I'm, all, no. I'm all set. Anyone else? I'm, um, I'm, go ahead, Mr. Zoll. Thank you. I, I think just to uh, Ms. Rosemarin's comments about um, the uh, the questions about scheduling a fall, fall town meeting to make sure that the school building committee continues to be able to be funded uh, to answer the questions that this board might have. I think it's, I, I'm not, it yeah. sounds like there's a couple of items, including the senior um, tax um issue that might be relevant so hopefully it's not a huge long town meeting but it might be a good future dis discussion because the long we talked about it today and um nick's i haven't talked to chair carroll yet but i do intend to talk to her next week and um you've been talking regularly with with um sean and the superintendent so what I'm, I, I agree with that. I knew that was out there. So okay. we already knew that was there. Yeah, I just wanted to find it. She just she rigid, reiterating what we already knew. So. Um, okay, so. I have a comment I'd like oh, to Oh, sure. Respond. Go ahead. Um, what do you want? Where's, where's the Sunday? Where are you on the future item? Citizen, 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 no, Citizen, I'm Citizen responding Citizen. to a public oh, okay, speak. Okay, okay. Um, to members of this board, town staff, to my fellow citizens, it is with much thought about our schools and our town that I speak to you tonight. I am a fresh perspective, and that is what I was elected to bring to this board. <clears throat> a lot of work and many years have gone into the solution, and I realize my coming at the 11th hour and questioning it will not be received warmly by many. I agree we have a school crowding issue. To what degree is the question? As I have said, a lot of work and many years have gone into this solution. But from what I've heard, 173.4 million was a new fact that demanded rethinking. I'm talking about this figure at our last meeting. My co colleague described the amount by stating, it shocks me. And further went on to say, this is the most significant financial decision any board has ever made on behalf of this town. So I took it upon myself to do some investigating. I began looking at the SBC presentation of 12219, and from that I tallied up the classrooms shown in that report for Cunningham, Collihart, Glover, and Tucker. And I found the current school population, PK through five from NESDEC, and the student per classroom count I arrived at from this was 20. Crude and simple, and not the whole picture, so I reached out to Cindy and Megan and asked them if they would do some research to me and this is what prompted their report, which they sent to me today, which she talked about tonight, which I can send to you all. I've not had a chance to completely review it. It's 88 pages, but I would like to schedule a meeting with the superintendent to present it and allow him to come back with data that challenges or confirms the data in the report. As you will see in the report, one of the items being asked was for a pause for a month to let us confirm or deny and I would like to report back to this board on September 24th meeting with re the results of our work. 
Can I ask a quick, just a quick question? You allude to Cindy and Megan. Um, can you identify? It's Cindy. I'm assuming yeah. it's Dr. Yeah. Christensen. Yeah, Dr. Christensen. Yeah. Which Megan? Meg Walsh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So you're going to do this on your own. You want to take this and meet with the superintendent and discuss it with him? I, I, yeah, okay. I would like to. Yeah. I would like to try to verify the the, the data. You want to try to make that happen for him, so he can. Yeah, I'm okay. happy to coordinate that. That's okay. that's fine. No problem. Okay. Anything else? Good. Yep. Okay. Good. All right. So, Chair, just uh, before you go into 26, uh, we won't be in a position to return to open session. So the select board can just, if the select board go into executive session and then can adjourn from executive session, we'll not have to return to open session. Okay. Okay. So, I move to enter. I'm using it. <laughs> I move to enter into executive session and consider the purchase, exchange, lease. A value of real property located at Jill Kathleen Lane, based on my belief that discussion on this matter in open session may have a detrimental effect on the negotiating position of the select board. The select board will re, will re no, the select board will adjourn from open session and will not return to open session from executive session. I'll second. All those in favor. I'll roll call vote. Mr. Zoll? Yes. Mr. Cohane? Yes. Ms. Musto? Yes. And myself. So we are adjourned and we're going into executive session. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. Hope that you had popcorn and a couple of drinks while you're watching this tonight. Thank you very much.